looks like Mike. Hey, Mike, here. It looks like everyone's here. Seven o'clock. Um, I'll were go you, ahead. Were you asking? This is TG. Were you asking TG is? Um, yeah. Can TG identify themselves, please? Yeah, it's Tom Glor. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like we have everyone here. Um, we'll start the select board meeting for Monday, April 5th, uh, 2021, 7 p.m. Uh, first order of business is to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. I have an addition from Bill Woodruff and that is to consider the certification of compliance for town road and bridge standards and network inventory which I think you can do under select board items. Okay, well, Adam, as item D. I'm sorry, E. e. Yeah. I, I move to approve the agenda as amended. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, first item is consent agenda items. Minutes for minutes of March 15th meeting, liquor licenses for Still Street Cafe, Thai Smile Restaurant, Bluestone, American Legion, and McGillitetti's Irish Pub, and the waiver of late fees for dog licenses. Um, do I have a motion or do we want to discuss? I mean, I guess item C might be worth discussing. I you think item C would be worth discussing. Okay. What's, um, Carla, can you run us through the typical timeline there and what kind of fees we're talking and late fees? Can you just remind the board? The typical timeline is that after April 1, there's a $2 late fee charge. Last year, you waived it for the entire duration. My goal is to try to get people to license their dogs and not penalize them right now. Okay. There are fewer dogs licensed during COVID than ever before. Okay. And how's that effort going, Carla? Or has it started? It's, it's going. I'll be sending out some reminder notices here soon, and I get uh, notifications on front porch forum. Do you see um, a lot of delinquencies or pretty much everybody up to par? Since we don't have an animal control officer, our dog licenses have declined in general over the last few years. And quite a bit during the last year. And a lot more people are getting puppies because of COVID, so. How does the info go out, Carla? Is that just like um, when people get dogs? And you know they get their they go to the vet and do the rabies and all that. But how do they know the process? Like how does that information go to the public? I only do it through front, front porch form. I don't know if the vet. Uh, that's a good point. I should call a couple of the veterinarians and ask them to let people know that they need to license their dogs. Yeah, I think that might be a good resource to use. And then I, the people that licensed their dogs last year, if they don't renew them, I send them a reminder notice. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. Um, all right, any other questions on that item or I'll take a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda items as listed. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Why, Katie? Yes. Yeah, correct. All right, been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, consent agenda items have passed. Uh, public, anyone from the public wishing to speak? Um, this is your opportunity to speak on anything that's not in the agenda. You're more than welcome to comment on the items as they come through the agenda, but this is also an opportunity to speak to anything else. Um, is there anyone that would like, you can digitally raise your hand or you can go ahead and just start speaking if you'd like. Okay, looks like we don't have anyone wishing to speak under the public section. So we'll move on to town clerk items. Consider contracts for land records vendor. Right, so this is for the digitization of land records. We're in our second five year contract with Avenue Insights. And that contract actually expired last September. 
but through COVID and other reasons, it has not yet been renewed. I do have a, a renewal contract at the same price for through September, and I have a second contract from a company called Profile that I'd like to switch over to in September. So there's two contracts with pretty much the same price that you're paying now. Okay. Any so the, additional questions? The money to pay the monthly fees, they provide all the equipment that we use to scan our computers, a server. The monthly fees are paid out of the restoration fund and they're paid from money that's set aside from reporting fees for that purpose. So it pays for itself out of the restoration fund. Can I ask a quick question? Why, why the change? I'm not real happy with Avenue's customer service. And I am I know the salesperson from Profile because he was my salesman for Avenue. And Profile is a nationwide company, but they actually have an office in Essex. So I get all my supplies from them. I can get my maps digitized in Essex without sending them off to Texas. And I have heard that the customer service is very good and the product is um, more, I'm much more up to date than the current product I'm using in terms of these features. Okay, great. Any other questions? I'll take a motion. Uh, does that need to be a motion to sign yes. the contract? Okay. Yes. And who's going to be signing that contract? Um, you can authorize me to sign it or Carla, I think. Anyone want to make that motion? Yeah, it can yep. be either of us. I'll move to uh, authorize Bill or Carla to sign a contract for land record vendors uh, in the order that Carla stated. Okay, is there a second? I'll okay. second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hey, uh, before you move on, Carla, what's the, uh, how much goes into that fund per page? So it's a $15 per page reporting fee by state statute, and four of the 15 goes into the restoration fund. Okay, so $4 per page recorded. Uh, we've got a little bit more than $46,000 in that restoration fund now. And, um, you know, it it certainly can handle this. Um, Carla's income will far exceed what the contract costs, I believe. It, it does, it, every month. Okay, yep. thanks, Bill. Um, all right, we will move on to select board business. Item A, consider scheduling a select board public hearing on the draft interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district recommended by the Planning Commission. Steve, yeah. do you want to, or Bill? No, Steve is here to talk about that. Thanks, okay. Mark. Good. So um, this is a topic that you're quite familiar with. The uh, Planning Commission has been working hard since um, your public hearing that you held, I think, back in February. And um, they've made quite um, a number of changes. I would say <clears throat> not a lot of substantive changes, but... Um, they uh, are uh, sending this draft via me with their recommendation that um, you schedule a public hearing and, and consider adoption of the interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district. Um, I'd just like to highlight a couple changes and um, then we can talk about um, how you wanna move forward with scheduling a, a public hearing on these bylaws. I think um, maybe Danny, for your benefit, uh, I'll just briefly say that um, interim bylaws are a, an avenue that's enabled under state statute um, when there are circumstances that uh, warrant a, an expedited review and approval process. And um, we found that there's some real barriers in our, our downtown area for uh, development, including um, barriers where we're considering um, brewing operation um, in association with a, a tasting room, that, that type of thing. Um, this really takes a little bit more comprehensive view of uh, the zoning in the downtown 
zoning district. It's based on our draft unified development bylaw that uh, the planning commission has been working on for about three years or so. So um, and I can certainly take some uh, questions. I'll just give you a brief overview and then uh, we can talk about next steps. So um, there was quite a bit of comment um, before at the public hearing uh, about the uh, thresholds for size of some different um, uses in the downtown zoning district. Uh, the Planning Commission did decide to increase those thresholds to uh, 4,000 square feet instead of 2,000 square feet and um, limit the, um, it's really a threshold for what's called a permitted use uh, versus a conditional use. So there's a more elaborate review for the larger projects that are over uh, 4,000 square feet. And this would include um, things like uh, restaurants and, um, and so on. Um, they did keep an upper limit on um, uh, three uses. Um, one is the um, food and beverage manufacturing, which includes uh, brewing alcoholic beverages or distilling alcoholic beverages. Uh, and that would be limited at uh, 4,000 square feet in this district. And then um, the light industry, uh, which is really a broad category, includes everything from uh, silk screen operations to um, a more um, production of, of products. Um, it's an indoor industrial use. And then um, there's one more use I'll, I'll um, See if I can find that here while we're while we're talking. Um, the the only area, and I I put this in the email that I sent out to you. The, the only area where um, the the planning commission had some um, changes that they wanted to make that um, I ended up approaching our attorney, our municipal attorney, uh, David Rue, um, about has to do with accessory dwelling units and it has to do with compliance with state statute. So um, I did work with our attorney. He had worked with us already on those bylaws to make sure that there's been uh, some changes in the state statute on accessory dwelling units over the last couple of years. So uh, since this draft was prepared. So we've got those bylaws in now in conformance with, with state statute. So um, with that, um, I think um, Bill wanted me to keep this uh, fairly brief. I could certainly uh, take any questions. Uh, my recommendation is that uh, we hold a public hearing. It needs to be warned for at least 15 days. Uh, the soonest we could hold the hearing would be Monday, April 26th. And um, we do have uh, this court case pending. We want to keep these moving so that we can uh, try to resolve that, get that project in for an application. And um, I think if, if we could hold a public hearing that evening, then I think it would, uh, it would help move these bylaws forward and perhaps help uh, resolve that case. So um, that, that would be my recommendation. It wouldn't inter interfere with your meeting on the 19th, which I believe is your next regular meeting where there, um, you've got some interviews and different things going on, but um, Bill, did you want to add anything before we open it up for some discussion? No, I think you've hit the high point, Steve. Uh, clearly, um, you know, Steve worked hard with the Planning Commission to get some uh, some more buy-in from them for these interim bylaws. I think they understand better what the issues are and why the interim bylaw approach is really the necessary one right now. Um, so I think you should warn the public hearing as soon as practicable and i think that would make it april 26 right steve that's that's as soon as we could do it yeah we can warn it in the times argus and we would get an article in the waterbury reader like we did last time and um i'd work with um lisa scalotti and her um, staff to get that accomplished as well we get the draft on our website uh with a, a latest news piece so it would be available to the public uh, directly from the website and then we can also send it out. Okay, um, 
anyone have any questions? Steve, what's your thoughts on uh, this? These interims, these interims being uh, close to the final, final uh, concluding set of, of bylaws. Uh, you think it could roll over into a, a final set or? Yeah, I, I think so, Chris. I think um, the, the Planning Commission has put a lot of work into these bylaws. I think, you know, they may recommend, you know, a um, few further tweaks, but um, I'm, they're going to have a discussion at their meeting next Monday about next steps. I'm going to encourage them to um, have a bit larger phase to the, the first phase of permanent bylaws, but uh, that would include this um, downtown zoning district. We would expand on it perhaps to include the um, area of the former village of Waterbury or basically our wastewater service district. Uh, that That's um, one approach that um, I'm gonna recommend. But yeah, I think, I think in really answer to your question, I think these are really uh, setting a good direction for where we're gonna go to lay the groundwork for our first phase of permanent bylaws. Good, good. Go ahead, Mike. Steve, if I'm not mistaken, you know, we still probably would need interim bylaws for the downtown district for the sake of, I, I don't know how close we are for overall town-wide, you know, full bylaws. Is, is that, would that be a correct statement? I think that's correct, Mike. Um, Danny, for your benefit, these bylaws have an effective period of two years and then they can be ex uh, if they're adopted by the select board, then they can be extended for a year. So they're meant to be uh, interim or, or or temporary. And then, um, but I would anticipate within that two years, uh, the planning commission would have a, I think it's gonna be a first phase though of the unified development bylaw, I think to expect the, the entire bylaw to be uh, ready in that period, maybe a little over optimistic. And and building consensus is is a very important piece of of dealing with these bylaws. I think we've built pretty good consens consensus over these interim bylaws and we wanna take take this in stages and build consensus. So um, yeah, uh, maybe, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And I, I really wanna thank you for working with the planning commission on kind of moving this forward. Some of the changes that you mentioned, I think make the interims a lot more tolerable and I, it's a good job. I, okay, I really good. appreciate it. Okay, good. And we're welcome your comment as well uh, at the hearing um, and um, your input. You, you can make substantive changes um, after the hearing and then adopt the bylaws. Um, probably not wholesale changes, but uh, with interim bylaws, you can uh, incorporate comments from the public or your own comments and, and make changes before you adopt them. So uh, keep that in mind. We're not trying to discourage comment at all. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo Mike's comments. I really appreciate the work the Planning Commission did. And I know it, it, you know there was some issue on timing and how things played out. So we really appreciate them uh, moving quickly on this and presenting something. So if you could extend that thanks from the board to that to that board that would be great um steve so just to make sure that everyone's clear and i, I believe i am the this is these are interim bylaws we as a select board we ultimately are the decider on whether or not these move forward um i think w just off of chris's comments there is no one no one else ultimately other than public comment we we are the deciders on whether or not we move forward with this and vote it through um the planning commission has showed us what they believe is the right set of ru the rules, but we ultimately are the ones that will be approving these, unlike maybe another scenario. I, I just wanna make sure that the board's clear that that's, the, that basically we'll go to, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully tonight approve that we're gonna warn a, a public meeting, offer an opportunity for the public to come and comment on any of the details of, of, of these, bylaws and then we then as a board can decide off of that public comment how we make any other changes to to this document and then make it approve it 
Now, what happens public the public meeting? What's the timeline after the public meeting? Just to remind the board. Yeah, um, you, the public hearing is closed, um, and, and you've had a chance to discuss uh, discuss the draft, make any subsequent changes. Um, you can adopt the bylaws; they become effective immediately. Um, so that that could happen that evening. That could happen that evening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. To answer your question about bylaws in general, the, the legislative body or the select board is the body that approves really any um, zoning bylaw. It just in this case, the planning commission doesn't have a formal uh, public hearing role. But they, they're always in the legislative function of drafting and recommending. Right. So on. Okay. Yeah, and, and with a permanent bylaw, if um, the select board had public comment and then decided to make substantive changes to it you'd have to warn another hearing and then take public comment on the changes you've made under the interim bylaw it's meant for efficiency so you can kind of hear what the public's comments are make any adjustments that you think is uh, are necessary and then adopt it right then that evening and they're effective immediately so this is a a, a, a very um effective way to get this uh, to happen uh, in a timely manner. <clears throat> okay. Do you have I guess a specific date in mind, Steve? Right, yeah, so I'd, yeah, I'd recommend um, Monday, April 26th at, um, at 7 p.m. I think you'll have, have your regular business taken care of on the 19th. Uh, you could uh, just focus on the public hearing that evening and um, we could we could get that warned. So so if you agree, then what I would suggest is is a motion to uh, hold a public hearing on the draft uh, interim bylaws for the downtown zoning district uh, dated uh, today, April fifth, uh, twenty twenty one, and state the date and time of the hearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's staff's recommendation. Steve, before anyone makes that, I just have one question. Did we change sure. the maximum principal building footprint? 5,000 just sounds small, but is that the where it changes from permitted to conditional or is that the maximum footprint for a building? Yeah, and um, we can have some more discussion at the hearing, but um, that's correct. The Planning Commission had a lot of discussion. They felt that uh, scale is very important in this district. Uh, we did, um, I did an inventory of all the commercial buildings in the downtown district, um, and the vast majority of them are under 5,000 square feet. Uh, there, are, there are three buildings I think are over 10,000 square feet, and there are a few that are, are in between. So that that's their recommendation. I mean, we could certainly have some more conversation about that, but that would be an answer to your question. That would be an upper limit on the footprint of a new building, um, not an existing building. So it's something um, that you could not change through conditional. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if there could be a, variance, like a variance yeah. process for that, uh, possibly because it's a dimensional requirement. But it would be an upper limit for building footprint. And is it currently five thousand? No, we we currently do not have a limit on building footprint. This is something that's in the um, the unified development bylaw. It's a new dimensional requirement. So that's something that. You could certainly take public comment on and have some further discussion about. Right. But that is footprint, Steve, right? That's, That's not footprint. Total square footage. Right. It's not total square footage. It could be a two or three or even four story building, correct? Right. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board or public? I'll take a motion. I, I think uh, that. The date would be Monday, April 26th. If the board is okay with that. Would that be a regular 7 p.m. time or an earlier time? I would yeah, suggest Steven, that. Yeah, Steve indicated that he would have it at sevens. So I moved to, to uh, hold a public, hearing, a public meeting on the interim uh, draft interim bylaws um, on Monday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Okay. Is there a second? OK, 
80 seconds. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Um, and again, that'll be an opportunity for the board as well to give feedback. So I suggest um, I didn't get a ton of time myself and we should definitely spend some time going through this before that meeting and bring our comments as well. So um, if you have questions, you're welcome to get in touch with me as well. If you have you know particular technical questions, that's fine. As individuals, okay. please. So Steve, you'll be out. sending you'll be sending out the draft version. Yeah, I did send it to you on Friday, but um, oh, you did. Yeah, I'll I can send it again if for any reason you don't have it. Okay, I'll look. Thanks. And, and there's two documents. There's a the bylaws, but there's also a map change. So take that into account too uh, when you're reviewing this because it, it is different. Um, there's an extension. I don't, um, Steve. I guess we're off of that topic, but did the the map change at all from the last meeting? It did not. Okay. So, Mark, um, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but you are going to have a select board meeting on the 19th. And if if your agenda allows, if the select board wants to discuss this by itself with Steve's uh, presence, and you know the public would be would be present for it, it would not be the public hearing. But if you want to discuss this, so you're kind of more prepared for the meeting on the 26th, you could put this on the agenda for a little bit more robust discussion about it if you think that would be helpful. I like that idea. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the board thinks, but I just, it would make it look like we're not going into that meeting, you know, not blind, but at least it looks like we've been able to hash out things that might look like very small things that we didn't get to tonight. So um, I saw Anne's hand first and uh, then I'll get a mic. Uh, could Steve uh, post the link on front porch forum and make sure Lisa has it uh, so that the public can see the draft. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that, Ann. I'll, I'm not a front porch forum user, but others in the office are. So yeah, we'll make sure to get that. Um, we'll get it on our website on the homepage and then we'll provide links. Okay. So. Okay, uh, Mike. Uh, Mark, I think that was an excellent idea. I, I, I really do like the idea that we flesh out any issues that we have before kind of a public hearing. I think it's just makes things look, look that we have at least discussed the matter that we're not going in this cold. You know, I think further discussion and I'd recommend that it be on the next agenda. If no other board members have a problem with that, I'll just go ahead and say, Carla, can you make sure that that's added to the next agenda? Okay, great. Okay, um, we will move to item B, Broadband Discussion Communications Union District. And this uh, came up off of an email we received from Dwayne, um, who's on the call. Um, Steve, I don't know if you wanna kick it off. And then um, Dwayne, you're more than welcome to, I know you have done some research on this and. Um, I don't know if the board is fully aware of kind of what's happening. I happen to be on Ring Road, um, so I'll recuse myself. We're not voting on anything tonight, but I'm recusing myself from anything other than you know um, the discussion. So, go ahead. No, I can I can uh, kick off the conversation, um, and Bill, you're welcome to jump in as, as well. So um, this is an area where I have some limited expertise, but I'll I'll tell you what I know. Um, the state statute um, enables what are called communications union districts, and the district for Central Vermont is called CV Fiber. Um, it's um, a very uh, active uh, communications union district, and um, the, the vast majority, if not all the towns in uh, Central Vermont area are already members. So, um, and this, um, provides uh, both access to funding and also uh, planning for um, future broadband uh, extensions, especially into underserved rural areas. And um, Duane, I know you're on the uh, meeting and you can certainly uh, speak to this from, from your 
personal experience, but uh, the broadband service in Vermont in general and in Waterbury uh, varies uh, widely as far as um, the, the um, robustness of, of the service. So um, we've been exchanging messages with um, Jeremy Hansen, who's the chair of the board and um, also David Healy, who's the uh, delegate from the town of Callis. So the, uh, the CV fiber organization is made up of delegates uh, from towns. A town can appoint, a select board can appoint a delegate and an alternate to the board. Uh, joining the uh, communications union district is a um, very straightforward process. My understanding is it just takes a motion by the select board to join uh, CV fiber. And then um, once you have a person or people who um, you would like to appoint as delegate and um, alternate, then that can be a motion as well to, um, to appoint those people. And uh, just like you would to another, um, you know, another committee or organization. So um, I think the best thing would be for me to uh, pass this over to um, Bill, if you had anything you wanted to add uh, at this point, feel free to jump um, in. Not, not really. Um, you know, this came about a couple of years ago. Um, Waterbury never really discussed it before tonight. Um, and I think I sent an email both to Steve and Mark to just make sure that if we joined this union, that we were not committing ourselves to undertaking the financing of anything that's already in the works. Um, I've, I received an email back that Steve forwarded to me. Um, and it appears that the way this union uh, district is organized is that I'm not sure if it's the law or if it's the union's uh, policy, if you will, but they're not advocating for use of tax money to, um, to build out the, the broadband system. The issue is that there's a lot of places in, in towns, even towns like Waterbury, which, you know, where I live and downtown has pretty good broadband service. But if you go just a, a mile or so from where I live, you have almost nothing. Um, but anyway, this organization is, um, I believe it's a, it's a municipality under Vermont law, just like the Regional Planning Commission would be a, a subdivision of the state. They have certain legal authority and they are searching for grants and other forms of uh, money beyond the property tax dollar to uh, build out the, the broadband system to places where it does not exist now. So as I understand it, we could join this without fear of having to step up to the plate and come up with tens of thousands of dollars to uh, fund what already they have decided upon. I wasn't exactly sure, Steve, um, there was something about 25-3, I don't know if it's 25 persons per every three miles or whatever, but uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, an expert on this issue either, but I don't think it will hurt us at all to join if that's what the board wants to do. And then you can discuss amongst yourself who the delegate should be. And uh, then the delegate will become the point person and we'll be able to educate all of you and us as uh, we move forward. Well, I think that the 25.3 is upload and download speed. Okay. Uh, great um, broadband and um, Dwayne, you can probably speak to this better than anyone, but um, the co uh, consolidated commu communications, the max is I think 10, uh, 10 over three, I think it's 10 upload, three download perhaps. Um, and uh, that's, that's the limit. So uh, Comcast has a, a higher level. Uh, I, I will mention that the, um, Federal stimulus bill, the most recent bill, has a significant amount of funding um, coming to states, including Vermont, for, including Vermont for broadband um, service extension. So I believe CV Fiber 
is hoping to get um, a good sized chunk of that funding to um, extend fiber. I think the extension of Comcast services is, is, goes through a different funding process uh, if it's beyond Comcast's own funding, and that may be through the Public Service Department. I, I've just heard that. But um, so I just wanted to add that, that, that it, th this is being driven in part by funding possibilities. And we have to be part of the Communications Union District <coughs> to take advantage of the, um, the federal funding that's, uh, that's coming through the state for broadband. Chris, do you want to, I, I recused myself, I don't know why, but I did. So can you, um, can you run this portion? <laughs> sure. Um, does any of the board have any questions as to either why or why, or why sh we should not um, be part of this organization? I don't see anybody jumping out and waving their hands. Mike? I don't see a problem, especially if it, if from what Bill's comment, it doesn't fiscally make us responsible for, for anything. I think it's good that we're all together, different towns and entities discussing broadband, but you know, I don't think that we as a union, it binds us to a specific, you know, course of action. I think we can treat it independently. It's my thought. Did Dwayne Mark, have something to say? Yeah, I was just, Mark had his hand up there. I was going to ask Dwayne. Yeah, I was going to see if Dwayne would uh, comment uh, more, and then I have a public comment as well. Well, thank you. So my name is Dwayne Peterson. I'm a resident of Waterbury Center. I'm not a technical expert and I, my business is not uh, uh, connected with this. So I'm just speaking as a citizen. Um, I would share that uh, the state of Vermont in 2015 created this concept of these community utility districts um, in response to the for-profit business community not really serving Vermonters well with the breadth of broadband. Um, and it's no necessary slight on them, but just their business model did not include uh, spending the tremendous amount of money to bring that technology to the hinterlands of our beloved state, uh, including much of Waterbury. And so the state created these so-called CUDs to kind of aggregate um, uh, support and demand for accelerated broadband distribution. Um, that said, it still costs a lot of money and there wasn't really money available. Um, yet the CUDs kind of citizen bodies, mind you, but just like this board uh, pulled their resources, their knowledge and put together kind of the conceptual infrastructure. What's really significant now, and why this is a truly great story, is uh, some of the federal stimulus money around the COVID catastrophe um, has been made available to states to accelerate broadband um, uh, access. And speaking for myself, I've been working from home. My wife's, uh, Ben and Jerry's employee has been working from home. There was that time when our grown children moved back to home we had four people here, uh, you know, uh, being employed in the modern way, trying to operate through internet and it, it, like it was awful and, and it didn't actually work. And so this is exactly COVID uh, disaster related and the federal government has made significant funds available um, to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, finally help us all with broadband. So. Uh, Vermont uh, legislature has a bill H360, which allocates $150 million to finally push broadband kind of over the top. Um, this bill passed the House 145 to 1. 
uh, it's now in the, the Senate Finance Committee uh, where uh, there, <laughs> there are streamers being thrown in celebration that this, this might finally get us where we've all been talking about for years and years. The bill does funnel this substantial amount of funds through these CUDs. And so this is what caught my eye a couple of weeks ago. Again, we have really crappy Wi-Fi. I'm really proud that I'm kind of coming through here, but like we are really eager to get into the 21st century. And when I saw that this, that this program, these funds were going to be allocated through the CUDs, which is, I guess, rational so uh, public policy. And I looked at the map and my beloved Waterbury is not a member of one of these. And so um, I brought it to my neighbor Mark's attention and gosh, you know, uh, is this on purpose? Is there something I'm missing? Is there some reason why we don't wanna be a party to this and we wanna go it alone? And if it's not, if it was an oversight because I don't know, these CUDs didn't really have oomph in the past, but boy, it appears as though they will now. This seems like something that uh, my town might ought to really look into lest uh, this ship sail without us. So to the degree that th there's no obligation on our part, we're not you know, committing taxpayer dollars, we're not necessarily committing any further action, but we would be a party to this new fangled municipality, the CUD, and thereby we could well have access to some chunk of this significant federal dollars flowing through the state allocated in this way, uh, it seems like um, we might wanna get on board. Well, Duane, I don't know how much of that bill you're familiar with, but it seems like this broadband issue would be a two-part component. Uh, one, uh, inf infrastructure upgrade first, if I'm correct, and then the broadband connection after that. Uh, does that does that bill address those two issues? Well, it, uh, I have it in front of me. Uh, it creates the Vermont Community Broadband Authority, which would be a statewide entity with all of two staff people to manage this rather sizable amount of money, $150 million, um, and allocate that through the CUDs uh, to build out this system. So um, it, it, and again, it was passed on 145 to one vote. And I don't know anything that gets out of our legislature with that kind of um, support. So. This seems real and it seems like a great opportunity. No, it's certainly a, a need that we've been needing for a long time. Um, I don't have any issues with, with you know, becoming a member of, of this organization. Is it CV or CB fiber? It's uh, CV like Victor, Chris, is in central Vermont. Yeah. So they're, they're, there are nine of these CUDs um, and our, our town of Waterbury is surrounded by two. One operates to the north, kind of Stowe and north through Lamoille. The other is mostly Washington County to what amounts to our east and south. Um, so I, 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 I don't know the relative merits of either one. I would hope that um, that wouldn't that wouldn't preclude our figuring out which way to go. Um, the significantly larger of the two in terms of towns is the Washington County version. I hasten to add that outside Chittenden County, which has predominantly quite effective broadband, there's only a couple dozen towns in the entire state that have not opted to join one of these. So Waterbury will be uh, in good stead uh, joining this party. Steve, is there somebody you had in mind to be kind of the liaison here? Or? Uh, I, I don't, Chris. I think um, what I would recommend, um, and Bill, you're welcome to chime in, is that you, um, you join the um, 
CV fiber so that technically we're joined. And then you may want to put out a call for people who would have interest and um, you know, maybe even interview some people just like you would for one of our own committees and boards. Um, I, I don't have somebody in mind, but um, that, that's what I would recommend. And then we can take a little time to get better educated. We can send you some resources as Lissa put in the chat. Uh, CV Fiber has a very good website. I can forward their mapping that's part of their feasibility work. So they've laid a lot of groundwork, but I think if we can all get better educated and then reach out to the community and find out uh, a couple of good rep, you know, representatives, maybe do some interviews, have some further discussion. That would be one avenue forward. Yeah, I think Steve is right that if we want to join this, and I think what happened was we, we just had uh, too many uh, balls in the air when this first came to light. You know, we were still in the flood recovery mode. We had uh, 25 flood recovery projects going on. We were trying to build the municipal building and we just, it just was something that nobody picked up and there was no champion for this and here we are. So I appreciate Dwayne, uh, you know, bringing it to Mark's attention so we can talk about it. I thought Alyssa was raising her hand to volunteer to be the uh, delegate to the, to the uh, organization for us. Michael. Would someone like um, Bob Butler, who does a lot of our computer stuff, and he's kind of um, civic minded, I think he would be an excellent candidate. Yeah, I, I had the same thought, Mike, but I think Steve is right. I think you should take action tonight to right. join. Take action and then and then we seek can the person. we can uh, put out there a solicitation for anyone who might be willing to be the delegate and uh, the alternate. And if you want to talk to Bob and ask him to apply, go ahead and do that. I'd be glad to do that. So then I'd take a motion uh, to, how do I want to do this? Come a motion, a move to become a member of the CB Fiber Organization uh, as an interested party, yes. I second that motion. Okay, motion has been made. Well, actually, I'd made. I somebody needs to make the motion, and then you can. Then you can oh, second. I thought, I thought you did that. No, I'm chairing the chairing the. Oh, because sorry. This, yes, correct. I'm. I, I I make a motion to. Um, I'll just say so moved. To, right, so moved. I make a motion to uh, okay. to uh, join with CV Fiber. Second. All right, there's Katie on the second. All right, motion been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Do we Lisa? know how to? I'm sorry, Lisa. That's okay, Danny. Go Do ahead. we know the steps for joining the CV Fiber CUD? I think we just I, did. Yeah, I, I oh, asked. It. It's just the. I vote. asked the question, Dan. I said, Great. "Is there an application?" They yeah. said, "No, just have the select board make a motion to join." That's exactly. all it takes. Excellent. And the appointing of the delegate and alternate is probably the more formal. Um, thank, thank heavens, it's easy. <laughs> first, first part's easy peasy, Alyssa. I just wanted to add some additional context and support for the board, which is to say. Um, this actually did come up, I think, two years ago when I was um, economic development director. Steve, I don't know if you remember, I think we actually met with Jeremy at that point. And just to speak to Dwayne's point, it, you know, being candid, it got very backburnered. I'm spoiled and live down in the village where, again, we have pretty good internet service. But I will say Ed Rooney of Edgeworks Creative and Mark Knows has pushed this in the economic development group for years. So I think they would all be really supportive. So just to know that it's come up in previous conversations before, but um, federal money certainly helps speed things up as well as awesome community members who bring it to the forefront. Um, and it's also something that's been brought up by the energy committee that I'm serving on still interim along with Steve um, because of work from home potential and not helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's actually in the energy plan that you all approved a long time ago. But again, just to say there's other support um, Jeremy, who's the current chair, served on the select board in Berlin, so he's also just a great resource about what it looks like to join as a municipality. Um, and I think there, you may have to say that you're open to letting them use public right-of-ways. 
um, essentially like hanging wires on poles. I don't know the details, but that just may be a follow-up that's vaguely sticking in my mind. Um, but again, their website is great. And Chris, you mentioned infrastructure. I think they're doing a poll survey right now to look at for the communities that are currently there um, where they basically can put fiber on poles that are already there. So I just want to say again, second the thanks to Dwayne for making this happen. I don't think I ever dreamed of it being, you know, this quick and easy, but um, it's awesome. And just another citizen comment and support. Steve. Yeah. Uh, just to explain what um, Alyssa and this, this may, I know we're discussing the motion, but um, they, um, Jeremy, sent me um, a quote from the statute that goes to Alyssa's point. It's just one sentence, I'll just read it. It says, each member shall make available for lease to the district one or more sites for a communications plant or components thereof within such member municipality. So they wanna make sure that if they need a, like a fiber switching station or something like that, that um, the municipality is open to like allowing this within the road right of way or that classic case would be something within a road right of way. So that's that goes to the point that Alyssa was making. Michael. I've been involved in this for a lot of years in my former life with USDA rural development. We had a whole broadband um, component that we tried and people are probably surprised to know that as much as we think of Vermont being kind of a pro progressive state in broadband, we're not as progressive as we think. Uh, and a lot has to do with our topography that limits uh, our broadband accessibility. We, you know, they, they have talked about, the legislature has talked about, you know, broadband for everyone. This has been talked about for the last 10 years. This whole union seems to be a way to move this forward because as Dwayne said, everyone really needs broadband. And what more have we saw as this pandemic where I can't even imagine people up in Essex County who don't have any access at all to broadband. It must be really hard to conduct education without, without some sort of broadband. Just my thoughts. Well, one of my concerns is I wasn't going to express it, but I will. Is uh, the difficulties in requesting those services in in development, such as the ones that I've had in the past? It's like pulling teeth to get these companies to uh, even come and entertain. Uh, you know, some some form of uh, internet being run into the development. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, this bill that the state has just passed, if there's any teeth in it to, um, you know, to, to upgrade the infrastructure is one thing, but then to get these companies to come install the broadband is is another. So I'm I'm curious to know um, how that's all laid out. If if in fact um, the broadband companies were involved in this this uh, bill that came forward uh, and are willing to participate in it. Yes, Dwayne, hoping you were going to answer. <laughs> yeah. So again, I'm uh, this is not my business, and I'm not an expert, but I really care because I need this. Um, my understanding is the 2015 statute that created these CUDs was in honest. Mm, reflection that these for-profit businesses were did not believe they were in a position to fund the broadband access that Vermonters need. And so to your point, you know, your development and where I live, I got a bid from Comcast. They, with a straight face, they gave me a proposal to bring a copper high-speed broadband to my home for $126,000. And, and, you know, I was, of course, flabbergasted, and I pushed back to the project engineer, and he walked me through, you know, the costs and what is trenching for two miles, and you're like, oh, okay, well, 
I, I guess that's what it actually costs. And you, Comcast, are not really willing to eat that. Um, and so it is this federal money, $150 million, which is on the table. And so these CUDs were created essentially to kind of bypass the for-profit uh, providers and create this mechanism to bring this technology to Vermonters um, kind of in, in some ways separate um, from those providers. And so it, it does remain to be seen how they will spend this money and how they will contract with whom to get this done. But Consolidated and Comcast are not the only companies who know how to string wire and connect to the World Wide Web. So uh, here we go, I think. Anybody else? Right. Well, I, I think we should join it. And $150 million is way more money than the state has right now. But at your price, Dwayne, that's about a thousand connections. You know, to yours was over a hundred over a hundred thousand dollars. If you divide that into 150 million, it's about a thousand. So well, ha happily, that was to get the service all the way up Ring Road and all the way up Bear Creek. So I actually went to organizing door to door to see if we couldn't like chip that up and so forth. So right. if it's 126 grand to get that to, I don't know how many is in my neighborhood, 40 families, you know, it's it starts it it starts to work. Um, no, I, and, I understand. I, I just wanted to point out that $150 million isn't as much as it sounds. It's, <laughs> it's a lot, and it's a lot better than we have, and I think we should move forward. So I would Fair recommend enough. you approve the motion that Mike made a little while ago. And let's yep, we're there. Over. We're there. The motion's been made and seconded, so uh, the further discussion went a little further than it probably should have. But, uh, no harm. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, Mark, you can have it back if you want to. Mike, you said aye, right? Did. Yes, I did. Okay. That probably was in between my hitting my button. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Dwayne, for bringing that to my attention yes. and um, bringing it to the board. I think that's a really important um, moment for Waterbury and the, I think 157 homes that are currently underserved. So maybe we can help them out. So thank you. Good. Thank you. I wish you well. Thanks, Dwayne. All right, uh, we'll move on to consider revised conflict of interest policy. Um, Bill sent it over to us. There was a red line version and a clean version. Um, it originated with um, Danny's comments from the last meeting, but ended up that apparently there's quite a bit more that we should change. So, um, yeah. Um, so, as Danny requested after the you know the motion was made to adopt what we've been adopting for years now, uh, Carla made those gender, gender neutral changes that Danny asked for and sent it over to me to just look at it. And uh, the further I read into it, I said, boy, this is really kind of uh, antiquated and it's, it's kind of difficult to, to see how it could be used. I had some questions about, uh, you know, how public officials were defined, um, where you would have the uh, ability of a select board to direct or to tell uh, an employee uh, that that they had a conflict and that they had to recuse themselves and that um, if if the employee did not do that the select board could seek the employee's uh, resignation and the like and it it raised some red flags because uh, the select board uh, in a town manager form of government in particular does not have real authority over personnel issues. So anyway, I sent the, the whole thing out to Joe McLean from Stitzel Page and Fletcher and asked him to review it. He did so, he changed some of it. And then he and I spoke uh, last week and we believe that we um, solved the whole uh, issue between select board and town manager and employees by defining 
the public officials who this policy applies to as elected officials of the community. So that would be the select board, that would be the listers, that would be the library commissioners and the employees that the select board actually appoints. So the select board appoints the town manager. So you could, you could have that role in terms of uh, determining that I had a conflict. Uh, you appoint the zoning administrator. You would have that role there, but um, <clears throat> it would leave the conflicts to other employees to be more of a personnel policy related issue where the manager would deal with it. So uh, I don't have the ability, like I said, to have it in front of me. I think that, you know, when, when, when I first talked to Joe McLean, he said, Bill, uh, there's not a conflict of interest policy in the state that's good. Um, he said, every one of them has these same kind of issues that you've uh, pointed out. And um, it, it's difficult. And he said, the state law requires the town to have a conflict of interest policy, but it sets no standards and no thresholds. And there are people in the legislature and in various state agencies who are working to try to have a more uniform policy. But I think this one that uh, he has ultimately recommended does what Danny asked to do, uh, which was the simple changes, and then puts this in a situation where um, this whole language of disqualification and then further down under Article 7 is really the kind of the meat of the, uh, of the issue. So yeah, so this article here um, where it talks about upon the majority vote of the select board request that official offending public officer resign their position. Uh, this would apply uh, when you look at how the uh, public official is, is uh, defined, would apply to elected officials. So, you know, the DRB, for example, um, and the planning commission, the select board appoints those bodies. So if you believe that there was an issue and a a uh, DRB member or a planning commission member had a conflict in your estimation, uh, under this policy, you could do something about that because the select board appoints that body. Um, if it were the library commissioners, well, they're elected officials, so they would have to apply this policy to themselves. They would be the board that uh, adjudicated that issue as far as anything in the library was concerned. The same thing with the listers or the cemetery commissioners because they're elected officials. But um, I think this is in good shape now. If you want to take more time to read it, I got it to you almost as quickly as Joe and I uh, finally, finally finalized it last week. It was Friday that he and I were finally able to uh, to kind of settle on the language. So um, I think it's ready. I think it's much better than it was before. And uh, if you're ready to talk about it or adopt it, uh, go ahead. But it's my recommendation that you do. All right, any discussion or does anyone want to make a motion? Go ahead, Mike. Just I, I would kind of ask, Danny, did this feel like it it met your things to be gender neutral? I'm just curious because on your perspective. Oh, sure. So the simple change was just changing the wording from he or she to they yeah. or them. So yeah, yeah, so absolutely. It looks like um, when I, I reviewed it and it looks like Carla did a thorough job. Good. Glad to hear that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. And I appreciate your asking to understand as well. I think it makes it a really inclusive piece of um, writing. Great. So I will make a motion to approve the uh, edited conflict of interest policy. Second. I second that motion. I think Katie beat you to it. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> 
No harm intended. <laughs> all right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah, thanks again, Carla, for uh, the work you put in and thanks, Bill, for catching that maybe we needed to review the document in its entirety, so. Yep. Sure, sure. That. Thanks. Okay, uh, we will move on to item D, consider Zenmar entertainment permit, which I believe expired last fall. And Mark, I'm probably gonna recuse myself at this point. Okay. I but, think it expires this April. Okay, um, but you'll be attending for public comment, I assume. Okay. Um, so who's driving this? Is, is so um, I'll, I'll do what I can with it. Carla can jump in if she uh, feels she needs to, but um, Noah Fishman reached out to both Carla and me uh, a week, a week and a half or so ago and asked about having it renewed. Um, Carla and I spoke, Carla sent to him the application for the entertainment permit and said that, you know, he had to apply again, because as Mark just indicated, the entertainment permit that was issued uh, last year um, expires in April. So um, Carla sent that off to Noah and we put it on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Um, I got an email from Noah the other day. I'm not sure, maybe Carla got it too. He, he suggested that uh, because he had had a conversation with Chris Bienz, he was going to leave the um, outdoor entertainment permit lying fallow right now, wasn't intending to address that at the moment, and had some comments about uh, why the select board even had an entertainment permit um, uh, ordinance, an entertainment ordinance for inside. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't respond to him, but I don't see that he's on the meeting tonight. I don't believe that he, uh, you know, has anything, well, he's not here. I can't speak for him. So to remind the board, I, I think I told you all this last year, and this will be the first time for Danny, of course, but uh, when the village of Waterbury existed, uh, there were numerous bars and uh, pubs and entertainment venues, if you will, in the village. Uh, there were places where people went to eat and to drink, and uh, and the proprietors of those places said, "Gee, you know, if we have music, that might draw in some additional clientele, and we can we can have music on." Friday or Saturday night or what have you. And uh, it was completely unregulated. And this, I'm talking back, you know, I came here in 1988. So this is in the early 90s when there was Sisters and then Sisters 2, the Thirsty Turtle, the pub was where the Blackback is now. Uh, those places, uh, many of them decided that they wanted to have entertainment and they just did so. And, um, you know, especially in the summer, in those days, none of those places were air conditioned. They would leave doors open and windows open to try to provide some ventilation in their buildings. And of course that allowed the sound to uh, go out much easier and much further. And the village trustees and the village police department and I received numerous complaints from people, especially on like Elm Street, uh, Randall Street, those areas. Um, Anne's raising her hand. Maybe she was one of the one that, that complained a little bit. Um, so as a result of the complaints that uh, residents, uh, people who lived in apartments and homes on those streets, uh, complaining about the, the noise from this entertainment, the village trustees adopted an entertainment ordinance. And it was a pretty simple ordinance. And it's frankly the same ordinance that the town has now. The town uh, didn't need one at the time because there were really no venues. Once in a while, something down at what was once called the Roadhouse on Route 2, uh, they had entertainment once in a while. But the town didn't have an ordinance because frankly, there were no places 
outside the village really that were providing this type of uh, um, uh, offering to the public. So the trustees adopted the ordinance and it was pretty simple. You paid a $25 fee for the permit. You came in, you explained on the application what you wanted to do. And pretty much the trustees um, issued the permits and said to the effect, um, you need to keep the doors and windows closed. You need to keep the sound inside as much as possible. And as time went on, I think that they basically even bought a decibel meter and said, and I can't remember the, 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 the level of the decibel reading, but you know, at the property line, the decibels can't be any higher than X. And uh, those were issued. The village had a police department, so it was rather easier than it is now to enforce these things because what would happen is, you know, there'd be entertainment happening in uh, August and the, it'd be hot, they'd open the doors and then somebody would call the cops and Reggie Irwin or Bummy Perry or one of those old time police officers uh, and even some of the newer ones, Anthony Mazzilli would go out and they'd go to the venue and they'd say, you know, we're getting a complaint. Uh, you need to either turn the music down or you got to shut the doors and see what happens. So that's what the entertainment permit is for. What we did last year, um, and it was really more pandemic driven than anything else, uh, the select board considered the entertainment request that Noah had, and you ended up giving him a permit to have outside entertainment. And um, in retrospect, I wonder now whether you really even had the authority to do it. I'm not suggesting that it was necessary, but um, I remember Mike and Matt at the time, Matt Fish, who's on the board, indicated that you know when uh, they were on the DRB, uh, the Zen Barn came and got a permit for operating. And I'm pretty sure there was in their conditional use permit, there's discussion about entertainment and what entertainment can be had. And I think last year, the select board's decision, frankly, overrode the, the DRB's uh, permitting process. And I don't really know if you have the authority to do that, but that's the history of the entertainment permit. Noah has suggested now that why does the select board even have this? Uh, you know, it's inside my building, it's part of the DRB. I don't know if he doesn't think he can afford the $25 or just doesn't want to deal with the, having to go to the select board after having already gone to the DRB in the past, but that's where we are right now. So with that, I'll stop and you folks can discuss things amongst yourselves. Uh, before, I think I'm going to have to recuse myself on this as well. So I think we have two of us now. Um, so would any of the current board members want to take over as chair? All right, Mike, I see your hand is up. So I'm going to hand it off to you. And I, I have some comment um, when you're ready to let me speak. Thanks. Okay. Hey, um, no, I is signing in. My apologies. I was busy taking minutes and didn't see him sitting in the waiting room. So I don't okay. know. My apologies, no, I didn't see you in the waiting room. No know. problem. Okay. Well, let's, uh, as acting chair, uh, let's let's have first a discussion about it. I don't know if we need a motion made, or I don't know, do we need a motion first? No, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing to move right now. There's no application pending. So you don't, there, this is just a general discussion, Mike. Right. Mm -hmm. There is an application pending for up for inside music. Oh well, I didn't see that. So he no Noah submitted, no submitted an application for uh, inside live music performances any day of the week during operating hours, and then outside acoustic live music performances volume not to exceed sixty decibels in the property line no more than three days per week. No music after nine, and then he emailed Bill and I and tabled the outside request. Is that correct, Noah? Sorry. Oh, yes, yes. So that's where we are. Okay, so there is a request for inside entertainment, which 
you know, it's a valid permit application. Um, I apologize, I, I didn't remember that. Um, so yeah, the select board has the authority to act on this application. Does anyone want to make a motion to act on on this this item? I just have a question for Noah. Are you planning on not doing any outdoor anything at all this summer and just sticking to indoors? Is that what you're planning? Um, well, you know, we had an issue. You know, our, our neighbor uh, had reached back out and expressed that they weren't supportive of us doing the outdoor music this year. We had intended to do um, like a limited number of outdoor uh, events um, and then um, decided to hold off on requesting it until we had more of a chance to discuss it with our neighbors and see if there's anything we can work out. But it seemed like the um, you know feeling of the board was that at least from last time was that if if um, we can't work something out with the the end, then it wasn't going to pass anyway. Um, so. Our feeling was to at least get the indoor music going um, and then see what we can work out for the outside if any if if we can do anything. I mean, obviously we would like to, but it, you know, it really depends. Um, and then the other thing I was just gonna say about the indoor music is um, I guess I was requesting in that email, I had asked if um, the board would consider giving us a longer term. Um, you know, I, I personally don't, quite understand where the um what the intent is of limiting indoor music generally um you know or it seemed like that even that concept of the ordinance that was dusted off from years ago that wasn't really enacted and wasn't used um for many years um to try to enforce getting permits for the indoor music seemed a little bit um of a stretch to me i understand it may be the technical you know, um, policy at this time, but, um, you know, I know for a fact, most of the other restaurants that are doing music are not, at least from my understanding, are not getting permits every time they want to do a show inside. And I, I guess at the very least, I'd ask for, you know, some extended term here. Can we, can I get, if not indefinitely, which I don't see as unreasonable, um, I would just ask to be able to do you know, not have to come back to you guys every year to get another permit um, that could be at the whim of a select board to say, well, no, you can't. I mean, that's our business model. We do music and food and inside. And I don't, I guess I'm wondering if I can't get a multi-year at least or some kind of approval just to have music, which is, as far as I understood, that was already part of our review and, you know, Act 250 stuff. We already went through all the approvals to be able to do what we're doing. So it seems like another process that seems somewhat um, onerous to have to go through to do the indoor music. Well, I entertain other, I do I do have some comments, but uh, our other board members, do they have comments from what Noah has just said? I do, I have some questions that maybe, I think Bill might be able to answer. You had mentioned that the um, ordinance came about, I guess in the nineties, is that correct? That was when it was created? Yeah, to the best of my recollection, Dan. Sure. And then you said it was a $25 fee, and was that an annual fee for a permit? Yeah, I believe it was. Sure. And then is there a limitation? So I guess Noah sort of alluded to this, but that was my question. Um, is Does that apply to all um, restaurants and bars in town? And do you know if all restaurants and bars in town do annually renew their indoor music fee uh, permit if yeah. they do the shows? So as I said before, um, the it was always easier when we had a police department to kind of remember that this was something that needed to be done. Uh, Noah, I think you probably weren't on, but the genesis of the whole permitting process was because places in the village were having entertainment and, and the neighbors were beginning to complain. So the trustees of the village adopted this ordinance. It is an annual permit. It, uh, I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but I remember the application permit. I think it expires on April 30th every year. So. 
um, it is something that needs to be done annually. Um, are we faithfully out there, you know, pounding on doors and sending this application permit out? No, um, because as I said, uh, without the police department, it's just not as kind of right in front of you as it was before. It uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that, but uh, yeah, the, the, the business community, some of them know, and some of them faithfully renew every year. Uh, others don't remember and don't say anything in, until, you know, somebody reminds them. So it is not um, consistently followed up on, I guess. And then I'm curious who, um, I guess I have two more questions. Uh, who oversees that? Is that just the board or is there, is there a process of um, overseeing that and checking or just is based on like incoming complaints and then follow up? Yeah, it's usually based on complaints. And then have we been, my second question and last for now is have we been, I know this year is very different due to the pandemic, but can, over the past maybe three or four years, have we been getting complaints in the village um, from indoor music or has it seemed like um, not so much of a, an issue since back in the day? Um, I don't get the complaints that I had before. As I said, I think the fact that we don't have a police department dampens the the complaints that we receive because what would happen is people would call the police. Maybe they're calling the police now. Um, we get the state police reports every month. I don't see a lot on there. But um, uh, when, when people are disturbed, when the peace is disturbed, the phone usually rings. And if, if people who are providing entertainment are doing so in a manner that isn't disturbing anybody, then nobody calls and then nobody thinks to say, hey, you've got an entertainment permit that says X, Y, and Z. I'm not here to defend or, or you know, suggest that the entertainment permit should go away or not. It's, it is what it is. We have it. Uh, it has been a tool that has been used. It has most of the time been effective when, when, when I've ever had to go talk to somebody, a proprietor of a, of a restaurant uh, and said, you know, we've received three or four complaints about what's going on. They typically tone it down for a while and like everything else, then after, after time, you know, it goes out of people's minds and it kind of ramps up again. So it's, from my perspective, it is not a big deal, but for the people who live near these places and when they uh, are disturbed by loud noise, it is a big deal to them and it should be taken seriously by all of us. Other comments? Mike? Yes, Chris? Well, Bill, to your point, uh, you know, let's face it, it's a form of recourse against violators, um, long and the short of it. And uh, I think it's a, you know, it's a reasonable tool. Um, keep peace in, in areas that, you know, uh, the zoning allows, I guess. Um, you know, to Noah's point, I don't care if he plays music till the cows come home inside or where the windows and doors are shut. But um, unfortunately, uh, his business is kind of a nighttime driven business. Um, when people are trying to sleep and then during the summer, after being locked up in the winter all year, up inside all winter, uh, you like to have fresh air during the summer and, and enjoy some of the peace and uh, you can't do that if there's outside venues playing music um, and you know the last thing I want to do is rub my neighbors the wrong way um, if it were you know four o'clock three o'clock in the afternoon two o'clock in the afternoon once in a while it might not be so bad but I think they have wedding 
venue uh, from time to time. Um, I don't know what the ordinance is on, on uh, music then, but I, I, I even think it's inside that. Uh, the DRB has set this rule. Um, I mean, even if Noah and I, for some reason, came to some kind of an agreement, uh, still that would be a DRB issue. And at, th at this point, I'm happy to have him play his music inside as loud as he wants, as long as it don't you know, reflect up here, but uh, I mean, I'm trying to respect him and I hope he's trying to respect me. And I think my wife wants to say something. Hi, um, I just want to make sure Noah understands this isn't a VNs thing. <laughs> this was a permit that we all went to a DRB meeting about. And yes, the deal was you could have weddings, which was great. I, I think I've told you or, or Ari, I love watching the little weddings out there. It's great to see them. Um, but the reception part of it and the music, that's the problem. And I disagree with Chris that it's okay to do it here and there and everywhere because it has happened in the afternoon. And I get a call from my mother who's down the hill, who's 80 years old, and she can't hear her TV. And she can't hear good anyway. So it's pretty bad if she can't hear her TV. So... I just want to make it clear, this isn't a, we're, we're running the show here. This was a permit, <laughs> okay? Yeah, and, and just to respond to that, I mean, that's why also we, I mean, we had asked to renew the, per originally this application was to renew the permit from last year. We just threw it in, we're like, all right, we'll just try to renew. And then, you know, we did get, you guys had reached out and said that, you know what, it's still like loud. Like we had a show, um, you know, I mean, the permit did go through April as far as the, the last At the permit. outdoor. The outdoor didn't. Okay. Well, as far as I was reading, I went back and looked at that permit. And what I, I mean, it was a little scribbled on. It was a little confusing on there. But what I understood on there was it was through April. So I thought we were still under the, that. That, that permit. permit you got does, but not the permit that the select board issued last year. That was in the fall. That was the end okay. of that. Okay. Well, what what when I was going back and looking at the the actual the permit, it, it looked it looked to me. I may be wrong, but it looked to me like we were through April. So that's why I was I was like, well, we had a really nice night out, and the, and then we had the bluegrass band. It was like, oh yeah, you guys can step outside, and we had, you know, was you know that was I thought that was still under the permit, and we could go back and look at that. But that's water under the bridge at this point. But you know, and then. We, when we got that complaint from you guys this you know, week or two ago, we said, well, let's just pull the permit and then if we can work something out, we can talk. If not, we're not gonna try to push, push it because we want a good relationship with our neighbor, just like you guys have, <clears throat> have said. And, uh, and all I'm saying is, you know, DRB and all these other folks have gone through and already said, we have to keep the doors closed, the windows closed, all that stuff. I'm just saying, it seems like another lot to do the indoor music. It just seems like a lot, like another round of red tape that I got to go through every year. It's not, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but at the same time, like, you know, got, trying to put the kids to bed. I know you guys volunteer and do all this work and it's really important and great, but like, you know, it's having to it's go through it every year point, and uh, worry about uh, it. Uh, well, well I, just want, I just want to clarify some things and going back to Bill's initial statement. And I just want to, you know, I guess we need to have some rules because the initial no, the, the initial, what we did initially when you requested, as Bill said, we probably weren't acting outside. It was not, it was in a something, a special request for the pandemic to allow you to have outdoor music. And I think that was the right thing to do, even though procedurally, we probably didn't have that authority to do that. As to, and I, I could say, because I have, first-hand information because I was on the DRB the initial permit was granted by the DRB specifically to provide only indoor music even going back further the initial permit for the establishment was really the establishment was going to be a restaurant yoga studio etc it was not deemed to be a nightclub and which it wound up morphing into be, being a nightclub, which really wasn't what was the per original permit application. 
So going, yes, it's, it's become a, a nightclub. The DRB had that responsibility to, for the good of the neighbors and whatnot, have, it was very specific, have music, close doors, it's fine. I'm looking at what was done. We basically, we're going back to where that permit is. And I, I say, I know you think it's a, it's a real problem to apply for an entertainment permit, but that's what your business has technically become. It's become an entertainment business, not a full, not just a restaurant, not a yoga studio, not, you know, a lot of other things. It's, it, it really is a restaurant slash nightclub. Uh, and as such, the DRB did give a permit recommendation. And I think we have to, as, as a select board, work on what that, that permit was. I don't know what more to say. I don't know if any of the other selectmen have, you know, kind of more comments on that. Well, just to respond to that real quick, Mike, I, I, sure. I mean, I see what you're saying, but the, the night, I mean, it's, it's a restaurant with music, um, which is, you know, yes, music is part and parcel of what we do to provide right. entertainment, you know, alongside our restaurant activities. Um, also, I just want to respond back to the ends, which I think they understand this, but we've never done, I mean, we, we didn't do outdoor music aside from you know a couple random times before we even knew that it wasn't even a thing it wasn't allowed we did we've always done indoor music and we don't have a problem doing indoor music and we're still doing dealing with covid um you know this is still like last year was an exception and we truly appreciate being able to do it outside and we appreciate the accommodation we were given for sure and it was strictly the pandemic that forced us to do this we never you know we hardly ever did outdoor things we all the weddings ceremony or whatever be outside they come inside for the party it's always all the restaurant activity i mean we we've done you know i i believe that aside from like you know a few honest maybe mistakes early on um you know we've tried to follow that initial you know ruling i guess from the drb or whatever um you know so i'm not even saying that you know and i'm fine i'll you know i'll apply for the permit i, I was just saying from the perspective of you know year to year i'm like all right you know live music is part of what we do with our restaurant it would be nice to know that we can do that going forward you know as agreed or in the terms of the drb rather than each year being at the whim of the select board saying well this year i don't know you know because this is our business model i i thought that in the previous approvals that get if we keep the doors closed and we do these things right that we should be able to have live music indefinitely so it just feel it's a little bit stressful as a business if you're like if all of a sudden we get a totally different select board in here and they're like you know what we just we don't even like Zen Barn and these guys are crazy and we don't even like live music anymore it's you know let's just take away their entertainment permit you know and all of a sudden we can't have live music inside that would seem very extreme in sort of in the power of this permit that's what I'm more concerned about not with you guys I don't think you would do that but you never know. And that uncertainty as a business owner is hard. Is hard. That's that's the only point I'm making about the indoor music. I totally hear you, Noah. I think what we're looking at is I don't think it's a big thing, and I think we want to perpetuate what your business is. I think it adds to the vibrancy of the community. But I think it's also for the neighbors and such. That's I think one of the reasons why the DRB put in that condition is it being you know indoors and closed in to avoid that amount of you know the, the noise issue you know we want you to operate successfully and i don't think it's too much to ask you know like any other business owner and if there are other business owners that are not complying they should probably be applying for entertainment you know <laughs> you know i don't think it's too onerous to apply for those entertainment permits and i don't think we're going to be very capricious to deny you know, you know, and I hope any select board is not going to take that. But if people are not going to be acting within their permits, that would be a reason, yeah, for right to, to deny someone a permit. I think to Danny's point, you know, uh, we probably should send an application out to all the all the businesses that uh, have this entertainment uh, 
and we should we should do it regularly. I don't have the ordinance in front of me, Noah, but pretty typically an ordinance will say something to the effect that the uh, you know the select board may not unreasonably withhold uh, a permit. So it's your property. You should be allowed to do what you want with your property with with some reasonable regulation. And uh, I think if a select board just said, no, we don't like music in any restaurants, we're not gonna issue any permits. I, I think that would be difficult. And uh, not that I want, would wanna force anybody to go to court, but it would be hard to uh, get that upheld. Uh, typically, uh, the boards are supposed to issue permits with reasonable conditions. Uh, and that's what this is about, reasonably conditioning these um, these businesses yeah. for this purpose. Chris and then Mark. Yeah. All I got to say is I think, you know, from my perspective, I think the DRB <laughs> split the apple in half and tried to make a happy medium. Um, and as far as the yearly permit issue, Noah, I mean, how does that differ from liquor permits? <laughs> Liquor permits are an annual thing, and um, you know you're not getting the pushback from them on that, uh, nor you. Um, I don't. I don't know that an entertainment permit it should be any different. That's all I have, Mark. Yeah, no. So you know, I'm not. I'm not participating. I'm participating as a citizen. I I recused myself because sisters and sisters too got mentioned. So I was, uh, <laughs> it's going to come in, but I think it makes sense for me to be recused on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I don't, I don't know if I have a permit in place right now. I know I had it years past. Um, I'd have to ask my general manager. So, um, you know, on the discussion of whether or not I even know if I have one, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think, Chris, to your comment, because I, I really do think that the indoor perm, indoor music should be part of the permit associated with the use in the DRB and not an annual permit. I, I, I didn't go into this meeting thing and that was a discussion or anything that I even thought about, but Chris, to your point, you know, if you have a, if you have an auto repair business and one of the things is that you need to keep a sound down to a, a reason, a decibel level for your neighbors, you know, then you do, the only thing you have to worry about every year is that you keep that decibel level down to your neighbors. But in in our business, yeah, that is a huge concern. If I lost my liquor permit, I'm out of business. And it sounds like Noah's saying if he loses his music permit, he's out of business. Um, I'm not in that scenario. I, I use music as a very small portion of my my business, but I could see in his business, I, I understand the business enough to, and know his business to know that that I'm sure is a huge stress. To, and, and I know he's had problems with, with um, you know, noise that has made you guys uncomfortable. And I totally respect that as well. And I think that that some of it has to be within a permit. And then the rest of it is between neighbors and understanding that if it's a continuation of a problem, then Noah's got to come up with solutions, whether it's a double airlock door or buffering of trees or something to try to help with the situation. You know, that's what I would do if I had, con and to answer, I think Danny's comment of downtown, I think I'm the one that does music the most. We are not what the 80s and 90s were, but we could be. I could sell tomorrow and there could be someone else that comes in and brings it right back. Who knows? So um, I'm always very conscious of my neighbors. There's a senior center across the street and um, I always fear that Lefty's going to come up the street with his decibel meter. So I think I live in that world of uh, concern of, of, of um, my neighbors um, being upset with the noise I'm making. But I think to the other point, you could have a neighbor, I, I, I don't know what our residential permitting is, but someone you could have, I, I have it up here right now in Ring that there is someone up on the hill that every day during the summer, last summer, there was loud music. But as far as I know, they can do that till 10 o'clock. And I don't think I can really necessarily, you know, they're allowed to do that as far as I know until I, I don't know what level of music can make me, or I know it makes me potentially upset, but you know, there's a certain amount of, noise that's allowed to happen. But I, I really do think to Noah's point that we do, you know, when I'm back on the board, it's just a conversation surrounding indoor music that I, I do really think it, it should be considered to be in the permit, just like another business use with some kind of at, at property perimeter decibel rating that lives within the permit that there's something to go back on. But I, I understand Noah's comments and I, and I totally understand Chris and Leanne, yours concerns and 
you know, I've gotten involved to try to help the situation as much as I can. But um, yeah, ultimately it comes down to really trying to know what do do your business, but also respect your neighbors as we've talked about in other times um, when I was on the board. So that's, that's my comment. Well, maybe Mark in response to what you just said, maybe that's something we really have to do in another select board meeting is do we want to go forward with entertainment permits as, as a general statement right now we have entertainment permits, you know, on the books. I know it's not probably totally followed, but you know, it, it, it is there. And as Bill said, do we just start sending out, you know, requests for people they need to get their entertainment permits or do we want to totally abandon that? That's, I don't know if that's, tonight's question but i'll let the rest of the board decide that yeah mike i i agree with you and i i would like to ask that we do have a maybe a bigger conversation around that and it seems like tonight's not the night i think just as we saw you know with a different perspective of the conflict of interest policy that had just been continually adopted maybe it's important to look at something that was created decades ago and see if it's serving the town and if it's not how can we better serve the town with that ordinance and update it um, and then also strive for consistency and equity for both the neighbors of the businesses and the business owners so keeping those in mind maybe we find a new happy medium with like a multi-year permit as Noah was suggesting um, or something that was you know sort of balanced in the middle mm -hmm. Katie anything you want to add to this? No, I was just wondering if we could call the question because we're half an hour behind schedule. Yep. I would. Uh, does anyone want now? Let me just clarify. Do we we're making a motion to let me think about what we're doing is we have approved before the outdoor permit and that's expired i don't the, so they've got an application i believe noah has submitted an application according to carla that had both on there both indoor and outdoor noah both to carla and me and then again reiterating to all of us tonight that they're they're withdrawing their request for the okay outdoor entertainment so right now what they're asking for is to be issued an entertainment permit for 2021 to 2022. As I said, I believe on the bottom of that permit, Carl, it says it's good through April 30th or something, doesn't it? That's correct. So I, the, I, permit that he, the permit that they have right now for indoor entertainment is still good for a couple more weeks, but He's applying for it so he can continue indoor for another year in indoor the... entertainment. Right. So the permit itself says inside live music performances any day of the week during operating hours. There's no conditions on that. Okay. Does anyone want to want to make a motion for that? It should be if you make a motion to approve it, I would suggest that you that the conditions you put on it uh, be that it complies with the DRB uh, regulations. DRB. The, the DRB permit. Right. And to Noah's point, that's why he's saying, why do I need to go through this? Because the DRB has already told him what he needs to do. But you've got to do it now because we have the ordinance in right. place. We're going to revisit yep. later whether we want to keep it. But for right now, we have it. They want to do entertainment inside, so you, you need to act on this permit. Does someone want to make a motion on this, or we'll pass over it if there's no motion? I'll make the motion to um, to accept the permit for the Zen Bar Entertainment for indoor entertainment for a year with the drb policy with the carly you got the wording on that i'll figure it out okay i think that's about right do we have a second i'll second there's a motion and a second is there any further discussion <laughs> if not uh all in favor vote 
Aye. 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 Any opposed? And there are, I guess, two, two, I don't know, would, would there be two abstentions or they're just? Yeah. And two abstentions. Motion carries. Thanks, Noah. Mark, Thanks, you guys. want to take that at the helm? Get Thanks, back to the some piece of music. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Noah, for attending tonight. All right. Um, I believe there's an E item that was added, and all I wrote down was Bill Woodruff. Um, I can, um, this is a request from Bill Woodruff. There is a form called a Certificate of Compliance for Town, Road, and Bridge Standards and Network Inventory that you'll need, if you so choose, to authorize Bill to sign. And this is uh, a requirement for much of the state grant funding with regards to road and bridges. If, if you sign it, um, you're, the town is available for state grant funding for such things as uh, roads, pavements, slope requirements, ditch treatment, culvert sizing, guardrail requirements. Yeah, okay. all, stuff, all stuff that they do in their highway project. Right, and and we've we've adopted this many times over. Uh, it's something that we have to do uh, annually. Um, we have a we have a, a highway ordinance, if you will, that that talks about the standards, the materials that we use. Uh, they're all in compliance with the with the state standards. Um, you know, this this came about. A number of years ago, mainly with regard to the whole stormwater issue and trying to keep the waterways clean, uh, we're we're already in compliance with this. We have the regional planning commission come in; uh, they do a, uh, an inventory. We have uh, highways that are hydrologically connected to streams inventoried uh, quite regularly. We get grant money for that. So this is really a pro forma thing. Uh, I would recommend that you uh, approve it, authorize um, its signature. Is what he asking for him to be able to sign it, Carla, or me? You. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, I'll take a motion. Carla, would you call it again? Our local roads policy? Um. So it'd be a motion to authorize a minute to approve the certificate certification of compliance for town road and bridge standards and network inventory and authorize the municipal manager to sign it. <laughs> so moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, uh, we're moving on to manager's items, property tax interest. Okay, as I put in the memo that I sent to you the other day, um, back in November, you decided to uh, waive interest through till April 1st. And uh, we're just a little unsure. Did you mean that we should press the button and charge interest on April 1st or press the button to start the accrual of interest on April 1st, which would mean the first interest payment would be due on May 1st. Um, it's as simple as that. And, and you did this, um, you know, you waived the interest for a period of time in response to the COVID pandemic to try to allow people to keep their money. Um, you cut the penalty last year. This is only interest. So, um, we're just waiting to decide whether you want interest charged as of April 1st or May 1st. Any board members? So I don't know if this is helpful, but the minute said, CVN's made a motion to authorize the manager to reduce the penalty fee from eight to 4% for 2020. Do now with no interest, with no interest payments until April 1st. 2021. <clears throat> right. Oh, so now. 
Right. Well, it. So on its face, it seems like we should just charge interest on April first. Um, but if you take a mortgage and you get your mortgage on April first, your first payment isn't until May. So do we turn the interest button on on April first and charge it one one percent or one and a half percent, whatever it is, in April? I mean, in May, or do you want to just? Charge it as of the other day. Right, Chris. I guess the first question I got to ask is how are we doing on delinquencies? Um, well, they're coming in slower than they were before. Uh, I can look quickly and tell you. I have it right here, Bill, I think. Karen printed me a list. I think we're at about 128,000. OK. And and she let me know that there are 31 house, households that are delinquent, of which nine are also delinquent in 2019. So that any idea of, of an average, how's that compare past years? Is it uh, a little higher than usual or? Yeah, I think it is. Hang on. What was the number, Carla, that she gave you? Uh, almost 128,000. Yeah, that's that would be uh, delinquent taxes, penalty, and interest would be about 128,000. Um, and for the same period a year ago, let me see. Yeah, last year at the end of March, we were at about uh, we were about uh, sixty-two thousand altogether. So we're about twice as much, still outstanding. So what are we talking for one month's interest on that? Is that, um, diff is that a difficult question? One hundred sixteen thousand. Uh, let me see. Isn't it just a hundred and or a little over a thousand bucks? It's one percent per month, right? Yeah, but only on the taxes. So, um, it's probably about seventeen hundred dollars, Chris. I believe it's one and a half percent right now. If it's one percent, it's uh, like Mark said, a little over a thousand. If no other board member is trying to jump in on this, I, I read Bill's email, and to me personally, I would, if I was in the situation and thought I had till April first and immediately got a bill, I, I would, I personally think that it should be accrued through the month, and the first bill would be. Um, because if we don't, if we bill them right on April 1st, we're basically saying that for March you were accruing interest and, you, and we're, we're expecting right. payment. So um, that's where I would go. And if it's $1,700 and obviously people are hurting twice as much potentially as last year, that any little bone I think we can throw them right now, I think would be appreciated. And I, I personally say that we don't, we don't hit them with a bill on April 1st. I agree with Mark a thousand percent. Okay. So um, someone should just make a motion that says that the accrual of interest starts on April 1st and uh, the first bill will be May 1st. Um, I want to make sure that Katie and Danny have an opportunity to chime in before we make the motion. Um, do you have any other opinion before we try to make that motion, Katie or Danny? No, I think I fully agree with you. I just, um, it's for this year, right? For <clears throat> May 1st, like a month from now? Yeah. That's what we're talking about, right? Because we're talking about April 1st. Right. As though it's in the future, though it's past. So it definitely seems. Right, well, <laughs> but we, so the direction I gave to the utility tax clerk last week was don't press the button until after the meeting. So. Right. If we, you know, the bills, April 1st was 
what day was April 1st? Friday? Five days Saturday, ago, yeah. Saturday? Five days uh, ago. The bills wouldn't have been going out until this week anyway. So gotcha. I just had her postpone pressing the button until after tonight's meeting. Okay. Um, I think I'm in agreement with that thought as well. And then just a side note for you, Mark, um, we did get wrapped on the knuckles earlier this year for the comment of throwing them a bone. So going forward, just a bit more lenient or something, just in case, you know, somebody's watching. Sure, heard, I apologize for that. Thank um, you, Katie. Yep, thanks, Katie. Um, can we uh, get a motion? Is there a motion or do we need to just clarify? You, you need to make a motion to okay. uh, start the accrual of interest on April 1st with the first bill on May 1st. I moved. Who oh. moved that? Don't know. <laughs> um, is there a second? Second. Who okay. moved it? Chris. I did. All right, uh, Bill, or it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right, uh, moving on to consider audit engagement letter. Yeah, very pro forma again. I think Carla sent that out to you uh, this morning. Um, I think it was, it, it's a pretty long letter that, you know, is a standard form letter that uh, accounting firms have to uh, produce when they're going to start an audit. Uh, all the right language is in there, and uh, the the price was I th was it twenty three thousand three hundred or twenty four thousand three hundred? It's like on page six or something something like that. I used to see in my previous life many of those letters. It's a very standard engagement letter, and I would recommend that it be approved. Yeah, and if you would authorize me to sign it as well, Mike, it's just okay. hard to get all the select board to sign it now. Yep. So, I make a motion to improve the auditor's engagement letter and give uh, the town manager the authorization to sign. Second it. All right, it's been made and seconded. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. I would like to make a comment that we should make sure that all the board members have an opportunity to make and uh, second motions. So let's give some of the other board members opportunities. All right. Uh, agenda. Discuss personnel policy. Yeah. So uh, in keeping with helping Danny wonder what kind of organization she got involved in here. Um, our personnel policy is woefully in need of amendment. And Chris, I think, is the only member of the board now who is on here who remembers the fun that we had back in uh, 2013 and 14 trying to go through this. The policy that we have in place right now was actually adopted in 1991. I think it was successfully amended one time after that, maybe around 2006. Um, it's a decent policy uh, as far as it goes, but there are many things that have happened over the years that uh, have not been incorporated that need to be. Uh, you know, the uh, Family Leave Act and, and other things like that, federal legislation, state legislation, uh, sexual harassment language and, and the like needs to be incorporated into this policy. Um, one of the reasons why it has been so difficult to get this over the hump and adopt it is because of the structure of the government in the community in which we live. Uh, it's a little less complicated than it once was, but when I was hired in 1988, I was hired offered the job to be the town manager by the board of selectmen at the time, uh, we call it a select board. I was offered the job to be the village manager by the village trustees. And I was offered the job to be uh, oversee the water and sewer departments by the elected water commissioners of the village. 
So those three entities hired me. Uh, there are also three other elected commissions out there that have uh, some interest in personnel, the library commissioners uh, and the cemetery commissioners, and now the EFUD um, commissioners, the Edward Ferrari Utility District has really replace the, the water and sewer commissioners of the village and the village trustees. So they're gone. Um, but if you look at the organization chart of, the, of this municipality that I manage, I've got four or five elected boards that I report to. And then all of the employees really kind of come and report directly to me. And we've always tried hard to uh, treat the employees as, as, as if they worked for one organization as opposed to two or three or more different municipalities. And uh, when we have had occasion to try to amend this policy, what ends up happening is we get, at the time, you know, four boards were in play. There was the trustees, there was the select board, there were the water sewer commissioners, and there, there, there were the library commissioners. And we worked long and hard, and we kind of went 98 yards down the field, and then we fumbled the ball, and it's still on the ground, and we, we never picked it up again. So um, we've, got to, we've got to do this. Uh, we've got to do it in a manner that uh, works with the, 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 the Edward Farai Utility District as well. The library commissioners are anxious to get something done. They have some personnel things that they're dealing with of late, and uh, we all really need a new policy. So I took the same approach that I did with that conflict of interest policy. The policy that we almost adopted was uh, a model plan from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, uh, their human resources um, director at, uh, I shouldn't say director, expert, if you will, at VLCT helped us get that personnel policy to the point of nearly adopting it. Um, I, I took that and I sent it to uh, Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher last week and said, look, we need to get over the hump on this. Um, we were almost there in 2014, 14, but here we are. It's, you know, it's seven years later now when we still don't have it. And there's been more legislation both at the federal and state level that have passed. So I got an email from uh, John Klesch at that uh, law firm uh, last night, and uh, they basically have a template that we, it's a good starting point, and to get us through this process, it's about $1,200, and um, that's actually pretty cheap when you feel, when you realize that these attorneys are billing out at two to $300 an hour uh, to, to get this done from soup to nuts for $1,200, I think is uh, worthwhile. Um, we're already gonna be over on our um, legal line items. We've had some issues. We had the 100 Mountain Child Care thing. We've got the, uh, a couple of zoning issues that we're dealing with. Um, I don't think it's uh, gonna be a killing matter in terms of being over budget. <laughs> but we are going to be over budget anyway on this legal line. So what I'd like to do, and you don't have to make a motion today, but is to get the general consensus from the board that this is something that you want to move forward on. I'll work with the attorney to get things to the point where I think I can bring it to the boards. And then we're going to have to go through the painful process of somehow getting the trustee or the e-fund commissioners and the library commissioners together with us to try to get this all done. But um, that's what I propose we should do. And I think that <coughs> um, 
we, we should we should have uh, an updated policy as as soon as we can. Okay, comments from the board. Chris, uh, I don't like you said, Bill. It's been a long time. Um, we're going to move forward with this. Then perhaps. You maybe may already have been thinking about it. Uh, send out the current policy um, so that we can get started on going through it ourselves, so that we can be up to snuff on it when we do get to get to talking about it. Yeah, what I what I propose we do, Chris, is that. Um, I think the best starting place, and I can certainly send you the one that was adopted in 1991. It is quite antiquated. Uh, it needs to have gender neutral language and a lot of other things to it as well. But I can send you what we have, but I think sending you the skeleton of the uh, proposal from the lawyer will be most helpful. And then we can kind of add some flesh onto it uh, with with the other boards. Uh, we got hung up the last time, frankly, on the, you know, right now our policy as far as leave time is concerned is a standard um, sick time, vacation time. Um, uh, that That's how it's, it's structured right now. And uh, there was an attempt there were some of the board members who felt strongly that we should move to a combined time off. Um, it proved difficult to, to do uh, getting buy-in from the employees. And we don't have any unions here, so we don't necessarily have to negotiate with employees, but because I think the employees are our greatest asset, I don't think it makes sense just to impose something on the employees without having them have the ability to understand how it affects them and how it might impact them. And, uh, you know, I thought moving to the combined time off was something that should be considered because we had a number of people, and this is going to sound generational, Katie, but, you know, people, old people like me, um, you know, the policy says you don't take sick time unless you're sick. It's not intended to be vacation time. So, you know, I've got 960, uh, 960 sick hours in my bank. When I get sick, I take one. I don't get sick very often. Um, and then, you know, I accrue it back and that's it. But a lot of the younger employees that have been with us for five years, 10 years, if you look at their sick banks, uh, looks like they either get sick an awful lot more than others of us ever did or they're using it for vacation time. And, and I thought that, well, if we made it combined time off and we didn't care why they took it as opposed to violating the, the policy and taking sick time and really using it as uh, vacation leave time, that it would be better to have a policy that uh, didn't make criminals, if you will, out of, out of some of the employees. But there was pushback from some of the older employees who had a lot of sick time and said, hey, I've built that sick time up. And if I have a heart attack or, you know, if I need to have an operation, you know, I've earned that over time. I don't want to just give that up. So that's why we fumble. That's where we kind of stalled out and uh, we can revisit those things. But does, does the game plan at least of working with this attorney work for you folks? Personnel issues are some of the most difficult things that we'll probably always deal with. And I agree, Bill, I think the first starting point we need to have is some legal op opinions. We have so many different things from Americans with Disability Act to a lot of diversity things to a lot of, you know, family leave and such. 
that we really have to, you, you almost need an expert in HR that is going to know all this. And that none of us are HR experts, but I'm sure that the attorneys will have some sort of template where they'll be able to guide us and figure out at least as a start. I am probably, call me, I'm old too, Bill, and I do have a little bit of a problem with the combined bank. I, I just think sick leave is when you're sick and annual leave is for when you want time off. You know, yes, are you going to chase after someone because they're, you know, n not sick, but that's, you know, really is an ethics kind of thing. And I think it's, you know, I know we always had our sick time. We encouraged people not to use their sick time because it always helped because the sick time bumped up their, their, the amount in their pension by a certain time. That's why it encouraged people to bank six time. Just like you said, is people who don't bank sick time, you know, if they do have something wrong, then you have to, I know some places have had leave sharing and stuff like that. It's really unfortunate for those who save their time, they're good. Those who didn't, you know, they're gonna be asking for time. Yeah. So and, and that and that's part of the issue, Mike. And again, um, it never was an issue for me. And I know, right. you know Leanne used to work for for us, and she was in the same boat that that I'm in now as a long term employee. But in Waterbury, you know, we don't. There's your sick time is there if you're sick, and if you retire and you have 960 hours of sick time, you don't You'll get anything it. for You'll it. Lose it. Right. So, uh, you know, we don't have a provision right now. I know there are some employers who say, you know, for every, you know, every uh, 200 hours that you get, you know, we'll convert one to a, another uh, day off or what have you. Uh, but of course, now with the pandemic, uh, I'm, we're more in a situation, I'm hoping that people as we go forward, even when they just get the common cold, will be deciding a little bit more often now to stay home than they used to, you know? Uh, they should. And uh, we've got to have to, you know, educate employees as to why we offer them sick time. And, and uh, you know, nobody's, nobody's indispensable that, you know, they, they have to never miss a day because they're sick. There's a lot of people who take pride in that. Oh, I never took a sick day in 30 years, but you know, maybe it would have been better for the rest of us if you had. <laughs> <laughs> I had staff like that. <laughs> okay. I, I would go bring it to the attorneys and then let's bring something back and let's try to get, let's try not to fumble on the two yard line. I, I agree. Um, any other select board members want to make a comment and then do we need a motion for this? I don't think you would need a motion, Mark. Just general consensus of the board is fine right now. Okay, so everyone in consensus that we move forward with that plan? Great. All right, Any, anything else on that or we'll move on? All right, next, uh, consider pay ranges for employees. Mark, can you put that up? Point. Yep, just a sec. Bill, I just had a question. Should this be something that's talked about in executive as it's pertaining to employees' wages and, and things like that, or no? No. Uh, public employees have no expectation for privacy when it comes to their wages or salaries. So there's, there's nothing here. I mean, most of these are ranges and cover several positions, but there are a few of us who are individual, um, uh, you know, we only have one highway superintendent. We only have one municipal manager, one, one community planner. But, you know, Katie, there's, there are a number of municipalities out there who in their annual report every year print the uh, wages and salaries of all their employees. I know some school districts even do it. So I appreciate the question, but no, there's no, there's no need to uh, go into executive session for this. So uh, as I said in my memo the other day, uh, the, budget, the budget was built with the idea that 
probably this time pretty much to be uh, an across the board increase of 2% in wages. Um, as I indicated, no, very few people have received any kind of wage increase since April of 2019. Um, the budget a year ago was passed. Uh, I think most people were gonna be in line for about 2.3 to 2.6% last year. Um, and then the pandemic struck and we had to be concerned about um, you know, how much revenue we were gonna lose and we ended up cutting uh, many projects and many services. Uh, Danny, I think you probably know, but we, we laid off um, fully, I think uh, nine people or so were fully laid off and then there were another five or six that had hours cut dramatically. Typically, uh, we adjust wages uh, in April. Um, we build a budget. The budget gets approved in March, <clears throat> the first Tuesday of March at town meeting. We wait 30 days for the appeal period to pass. And then after the appeal period passes, that's typically when people get uh, pay increases if they're going to get them. And as I said, a year ago, uh, everyone was in line to get some kind of increase, even if it was just a COLA increase. Because of the pandemic, um, we, we cut spending and we didn't give anybody a pay increase at all last year. Uh, all of the salaried employees took a voluntary 5% pay cut that uh, stayed in effect from um, when the pandemic started in uh, late March, early April, and that 5% pay cut stayed in place for the salaried employees right through into August. And then uh, the pandemic started to ease a little bit. Uh, I, I told the salaried employees that they could go back to their uh, former wage rate or salary rate. So anyway, uh, I did take the opportunity to use the VLCT salary survey. I've upgraded these uh, these ranges, I left the old ones which were adopted in 2018 and then the ones in yellow highlight is what I'm proposing now. Um, I would recommend and ask the select board to approve this and also uh, authorize me to go ahead and pull the trigger on uh, issuing the raises that were built into the budget this year with the understanding that a 2% increase, um, just the cost of living <laughs> since 2019 uh, far exceeds this increase. So anyway, with that, I'll stop. I don't know where my unmute button went when I am screen share. So sorry, <laughs> I had to take it off screen share. Um, does anyone need that backup? And then I'll figure out how to unmute. Okay. Um, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, Bill, maybe I just have some questions where I guess I assume the ones that you, that you put like an annual salary, those are salaried employees. Yeah. And the ones that you're putting a wage rate, I guess I'm not con wondering you know, where is the 2%? Is that at the bottom end or is that, you know, because a lot of them, there's a big range as to where they could be. Yeah, so if, Mark, if you can put that back up again for just a second. So, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the highway labor ones, Mike, we have seven employees there. And um, while even when the range was $17 to $27 per hour, um, nobody was above the midpoint of that range. Uh, so if there's a highway employee right now who's making $20 an hour, the idea is that that highway employee is going to get a raise of 2%. So we go to $20.40 an hour. 
Um, the ranges, what I've done with the ranges, Mike, is used inflation over the past couple of years and the VLCT salary survey to say, okay, highway laborers across the state are in this range. We need to be competitive. Uh, we're not paying any highway laborer $30 an hour right now. We could under this scenario, but it will take time before anybody gets up anywhere close to the top of that. I think the highest highway employee, um, you know, not including Celia, would be in the in the twenty five dollar range right now, Mike. Okay, because I was just wondering, like, just I'll just take one, just like public works director, you know, where it says sixty five to ninety thousand yep. dollars. Just you know. That's a pretty big range. Yeah, it is a big range. And first of all, the public works director, uh, you notice that the memo is to the uh, EFUD commissioners as well as the select board. Right. So the public works director position is actually an EFUD position. It's it's not a town, a direct town position. Uh, the range is so big there because most public work directors when people think of that, think of somebody who's uh, uh, maybe a professional engineer and has a professional degree. But we have, uh, there are public works directors, including our own, that uh, basically have earned their way into that position through experience. They don't have a, a professional degree. Yeah, so the be. range on that one is pretty large. I agree with that. And you can see there on that one, Mike, I didn't adjust the lower end of the range just because of what I just said, but the upper end of the range uh, has increased a little bit uh, just because that would be somebody who's got a professional degree probably. Yeah, that's, that's the reason why I kind of ask is that I think the statement that you made, Bill, is yes, the staff is probably one of our best assets, but I guess I'm also a little bit concerned because we're still in somewhat, I know some people don't want to acknowledge that we're still in a pandemic kind of situation. I'm still a little bit concerned about, you know, you know, finances as much as, you know, you know, great employees, you know, deserve to be rewarded. I just, I, I guess I have a little problem with some of the ranges as, as to where we're going to be financially, you know, you know, because we're still we're still having effects of this pandemic. Yeah, I understand, Mike. But as I said, and I think I put it in the memo as well, there there is hardly anybody who's above the midpoint of these ranges okay. that works for us. So the this is just to tell you that. You know, if we had to go out and recruit a new wastewater treatment plant operator, and that's, again, an EFUD position, uh, you know, we just had a, an $8 million upgrade to that plant a couple of years ago, and it's got a pretty sophisticated system uh, of removing phosphorus from the wastewater. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we would have to have that range because to get somebody who has that kind of experience to do that job, you might have to pay close to that $38 an hour to get them. Uh, mm -hmm. Our guy is way down, you know, much closer to the $25 range right now, but he's been here for, uh, you know, 18 years or something like that. And he has grown with the position, but uh, we would never hire the guy that we have now into that position because he he wouldn't know how to operate the plant except for the fact that he's been here while we built it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a range where you can hire people, but nobody nobody is at the top of these ranges for us. And and I think you know basically a two percent increase after uh, two years is is it fits into the budget, Mike. You we've yeah. already. Uh, you know, the select board approved the budget and the voters approved the budget. I don't think this is going to be the the place where the budget gets broken. No, that answers my question. I was just 
more concerned about if everyone was on the right end of the spectrum. No, no, boy, it's it, it's going to really be a har har hardship on the community. No, nobody's no not nobody's close to the right end on the range of life. That's good to know. Thanks. So, if everybody's comfortable, could we remove this screen share? Go back to. Uh, <laughs> Full screen. Appreciate that. Um, so I just want Danny to know how I how I stand on this thing. Um, it's always been uh, kind of a rub for me: government government uh, employees versus private sector. Um, there's a benefit package involved in this that shouldn't stand alone uh, when we're talking, having this discussion. Um, you know, I've been in the private sector all my life. I see what, all my working career, I see what people out there in the private sector get paid. Um, they, their ranges may be comparable to what's being proposed now, probably on the lower end, but typically there's no benefit packages. Raises don't come on an annual basis. Um, sometimes they're spaced as far as three and five and seven years apart. I've had people tell me that they hadn't had a raises to those extremes. Um, and it's difficult for me to, you know, Bill and I've had this discussion the year after year, uh, give increases in pay uh, when, uh, when private sectors aren't. And typically what happens here in this municipality, and I'm sure others, along with it comes increases in uh, healthcare benefits, um, pension benefits uh, and alike. Um, for a while I've been interested in seeing if there was a way that we could space this um, cost of living increase on a two year basis to make it more even keel with the private sector. It's still far from what the private sector, in my opinion, gets. Um, as a business owner, I don't increase my uh, rates from year to year. Um, because of the domino effect, not only in the business that I'm in, but other people that are in the business that my business encompasses. Um, don't do that either. They have to kind of flow with the, the free market enterprise um, based on economics. Uh, and one question I wanted to ask Bill, if he felt that, um, the staff has in, has been shortchanged this year due to everything else that's kind of been piled in with the mix. Um, you know, it was great and and uh, uh, very um, good of of the the staff members that were. Um, Valerie to volunteer to, to have a cutback. Um, I think moving forward, there was a way that, you know, in critical times, um, and you can tell me, Bill, maybe that's happened in the past where there's been instances where uh, wages decrease due to economic hardships. Uh, as it would in the private sector um, with layoffs and furloughs happening in the private sector when economic times dictate that people have to lay off or fire people because they just don't have the business. So, you know, <clears throat> staff has always been a critical part of the budgeting process, not only with municipalities, uh, school budgets, you know, the staff costs are 85% of the budget. Um, so 
So I, you know, those are a few issues out there that if the board has any reason to want to think we could change or alter a little bit to be more in step with the private sector, or is this just something that's not negotiable? Well, let me, let me Danny, I see your hand up. Um, well, it's certainly from my perspective, Chris, it, nothing is not negotiable. I. I hear what you're saying. I appreciate your your concerns, and uh, you know, I think I've told you in the past that I've had contractors work for me, and uh, I've seen that they haven't um, changed their, you know, their billing rate. And I talk to them about it, and uh, you know, um, I try to take care of those people from my perspective. You know, just doing business with them. You choose to do what you 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 do with with your business. You have the competition that's out there. You know your market, and 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 you're entitled to do what you do with with uh, your pricing and with what you pay your employees. Um, I can't remember a time that we've actually cut anybody's wages, Chris. I mean, if somebody has been, you know, making $15 an hour, um, I can't remember a time in my career as a municipal manager where we've gone to that person and said, well, you know what, we're going to lower you to $14 an hour because of economic conditions. Um, we have um, many times in the past, we have given very minimal raises. There have been a few years like this between 2019 and 2020 where we didn't give any raises. Um, that was certainly driven by the pandemic. No employee came to me and said, hey, you know, you didn't give me a raise. It's April. It's where's my raise? Nobody said that. Uh, as I indicated, salaried employees uh, did take a pay cut last year. Um, I think that at least from my perspective, I have always tried to be responsive and cognizant of the, the fact that taxpayers are paying the freight here. Um, over time, we, yeah, we, have a, we have a benefit package and maybe it's a, a better ben benefit package than some people in the private sector are able to give. But we have, we have reduced the richness of that benefit package over time. Uh, most of our employees are on high deductible health care plans now. We help them. We put some money in their health savings account. There's no question about it. But I don't think that, at least from my perspective, that I've ever been cavalier about the fact that taxpayers are paying the bill here. Um, the ranges I, I, I found this memo. I said, oh, it's been since 2018 since that's been adjusted. So I, I adjusted the ranges uh, the way that I believe that they should be adjusted. As I already answered, Mike, nobody is at the top of the range. Uh, and we're talking about for the impact this year, a 2% wage increase for our employees. And, and yeah, I, I know we're still in the pandemic period. Um, I can't remember if we explicitly had this conversation when we put the budget together, but initially I was asked, you know, to put a budget together that was going to be 51 cents. Um, we ended up agreeing that the budget should require a 53 cent tax rate. The salary and wage line items all from the beginning were all shown to you. So I can't remember if I told you at the time that, um, that you know, the cost of living is running about 2% right now, uh, but it certainly wasn't hidden. So the, the board can do what it wants and I, I won't take any offense to it, but I just wanna state from my perspective I don't think anybody, certainly at, in the management levels, me and the department heads, are fully cognizant that that you know taxpayers pay these bills. 
Bill, is it a, is it generally an annual increase based on cost of living for pay rates? Or it's just evaluated? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have always tried, Danny, mm -hmm. to provide at least a cost of living increase. So every year I look at the CPIU numbers from the Federal Department of Labor Statistics and you know see that from December 2020 to December, I mean, 2019 to 2020, what I don't have it in front of me right now, but cost of living was 1.9%. So we have always tried to give cost of living increases or close to that. It's, it's not always happened. There's been some years where it's been shaved a little bit. Um, <clears throat> there are far fewer years when, when uh, we get significant amount of money to give people a raise that would be a raise, you know, if the cost of living adjustment keeps you even where you were in the past. Um, so there have been few years in my 30 year term where say the cost of living, you know, back 15 years ago might've been 3% and we've, the boards have authorized maybe a 5% increase. But when that happens, when there's typically money above the cost of living increases, um, I typically have not just doled that out uh, on an across the board basis. Because if somebody's making $20 an hour and they're doing the same job that somebody's making $15 an hour to do, if you give them both a 5% increase, the person who's the higher paid person gets further ahead of the lower paid person because 2%, 3%, whatever the percent is above the cost of living adjustment is gonna be higher if the base is higher. Mm -hmm. So I try in those cases to tell people, look, we have other ways to reward longevity, to get more vacation time if you've been here for 15 years. You know, if you're driving a truck after, you know, five or seven years, you're, you're not adding much more value. You kind of know what the job is and you're equally able to do it with somebody who's been here for 15 or 20 years. So in those cases, when the boards have provided additional money, um, usually that tries to go to the, you know, the lower paid people and obviously some for merit. There are some merit pay raises that get given for, you know, once in a while as well. So that, that kind of leads into the question I had in the last paragraph of your memo. In the last two sentences, it talks about um, some modest raises later in the year to recognize merit. So are you suggesting that 2% raises across the board and then later on giving people extra based on <coughs> on the work that they've done this year or yeah that's that's right katie and typically um you know there there are some people that i'm proposing get a little higher than the two percent across the board right now i think that and if we want to talk about specific people we do need to go into executive session for that but uh the last the the last point that you made there kate katie is that you know um there, there is a little bit of money that if I just gave the, if we just gave 2% across the board, probably all the money in the salary line items would not be eaten up. And there is room to be able to give somebody something a little bit later in the year. Um, but uh, that, that's not a foregone conclusion that that will happen. Go ahead, Mike. So is there any provision? Because I always like to re reward people who work well. But conversely, people who are margin, you know, I, I don't know if that's even, I don't even know how many, if, if any, do we have of those folks. Do we have, you know, is there a provision that if people are not, kind of or they're marginally producing that there's not even going to be a raise for those folks you know that's kind of like the old merit pay people who are performing better 
you know, get higher raises. And I'm a big believer in that. Yeah. Um, we've typically not withheld cost of living increases, Mike. Because uh, of lack of performance. Or lack of production. But certainly, <coughs> you know, if this isn't a good year to, to right. as an example, because there's really not a lot of money for a lot of, you know, real increases. This is just asking if we can give uh, an, a, a, basically an across the board adjustment to, for people who haven't been, haven't had an increase since April of 2019. Totally um, but in the years that we do have more money, Mike, yeah, uh, maybe everybody gets the one or two percent cola. But if that's, you know, if there's no merit there, you know, then then they're told, hey, you know, you're not getting no incentive extra. to do well. Right. I don't think I've commented yet on this. Um, yeah, I think that, that there's so many moving parts to this, and I find I struggle with this in my own business. Um, obviously, there's a retainment conversation that has to be had. Of you know, if we if we potentially keep wages low, we could potentially lose people. But it doesn't seem like for year over year we we are necessarily where that's a huge part of this conversation. But obviously, a concern. Um, I. Well, obviously, I'm in the business similar to Chris. I have about 100 employees now, and and juggling cost. And back to your comment, Mike, about um, performance and automatic wage increases. But I, I, I think what I've learned over the years with Bill is that I do feel like he takes expense very seriously. I think he does try to hire at levels that are appropriate for our budget. Um, and I think that you know these proposals come with a lot of, of forethought. Um, I think you know maybe something that would be helpful for me is understanding what this ultimately you know I think obviously I could go and look at um, the budget increase and, and try to understand what this represents as a number. Um, the comment of the compounding potential discrepancy between wages is an interesting one that I might want to research further. But um, I think it would be helpful just to understand as we talk about this and find out that it's a uh, you know a twenty thousand dollar annual difference versus a hundred thousand dollar annual difference. I know those numbers aren't even appropriate, but um, is important in the conversation of just understanding what maybe these annual increases are, um, which I know I could go find that information. Um, and I think it's also important for the the board members, especially the ones that maybe haven't seen, build. Bill gets a raise from us and, you know, some, he, he asks because we don't offer it, which is something we also should talk about as a board to make sure that, you know, it's, it's a situation where we have to understand that Bill gets to set everyone's wages, but we ultimately get to set bills. And so he has to ask in, in letters like this. So that's why it's appropriate and why it's fair to, to ask that. Um, he does mention that, um, I don't know, Danny, if you knew that he had a car until recently that we paid for. Um, he no longer has that vehicle. And so that's mentioned there as well. So that's just a, a point. Um, I, I, I think for, for me personally, I think that we should support the increase, but I would like to have a conversation outside of these conversations of a strategy. So there's no surprises, a lot more conversation around how we deal with um, percentage versus other strategies that maybe make it clear to employees of how their wage curve works. And we as a board, and especially when board members maybe are only on here for a year and this conversation comes up, there's much more of a game plan that is clear. I know Bill has his game plan and, and um, I think it just would be helpful and we could try to buy into that game plan as a current board and then hopefully following boards can have more of the the game plan, especially, you know, if and when Bill leaves and, you know, whoever takes his position, you know, is it's, you know, trying to make sure that they have a clear rule book that we as a board hope continues. So that, those are my comments, but um, I, I did have one question, Bill, and maybe you could explain it. I know you said 
you know, most of the wages are at the halfway point or below. But if you take someone like cheap water sewer operator, the halfway point is, I think, $22.50. And the new base, the lowest wage would be 25 So are there some scenarios in this that there's a significant increase because the base is higher? Yeah, I think the floor? so part, part of the... Part of the issue there, Mark, is that uh, again, I the last time we actually went through this kind of exercise was 2018, and there are a couple of people in the chief wastewater operator, especially because of that uh, phosphorus upgrade. He he ended up ticking up above the the range that was there before. So he's a little higher than the old range already. So he's not gonna get an astronomical increase to get bumped up into, into the new range. But again, that's an EFUD issue and I'm not splitting hairs with you, but that's a, an employee for the, the utility district. It's nobody under the select board's control, so. But you're saying that potentially someone could get paid outside of this range, and it's in the in a perfect world, it shouldn't hap it shouldn't happen. There should be an adjustment of the ranges if you're gonna if you're gonna pay somebody above the range. But in that particular case, because of changes, you know the 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 job description and the person's responsibility ratcheted up pretty significantly from what it was before. It was a simple aerated lagoon and now it's a, you know, it's a phosphorus removal plant. So we had to pay that person commensurate with what, what they were gonna be, be doing. And it, it just so happened he, he got above the range, so. Um, additional comments? I have some questions, but I feel like it's not going to serve us based on how late it is tonight, and it doesn't change, you know, my opinion about what to do tonight. So I'm, I would love to Mark see if we could do what you suggested, maybe have, you know, a bigger conversation at another time. Sure. Chris, I think I saw your hand up. Yeah, I'll try to make it quick. I just want everybody to know that this is a difficult conversation for me. Nobody wants to go against the rain, the grain, and I just happen to be uh, have this rub about uh, this issue, and it's not anything to do with the staff. It's the institution that's been developed over time. That being in the, from the private sector, all my working career, uh, it's it seems like the two are separating further and further. People are receiving raises every year and benefit increases every year, and then people in the private sector aren't. But then they're they're expected to reach into their pocket, to give to those who are. And you know, I'll never be happy with it. I mean, my you know, Bill and everybody else there. My wife was a municipal employee for 35 years, so um, he knows I've had that that same rub for a while. Um, and well, I guess I'm just people in the private sector and, and I, Chris, I, I am, struggle that they have. And I, I know, Bill, that you are 100 percent cognizant of the of the finances and the economics of this municipality. I, no, that's, I, not, that's not what I was going to say. Never thought anything different. No, I, I understand ahead. that. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not taking it personally. I guess. I guess, however, I get the rub that you feel, but you, you either have to say, okay, we're gonna do this, or you gotta propose something different. And, and I, don't, I understand that you don't like the system and you think that the public employees are somehow different than private sector employees, but there's no proposal for anything different. Well, I, yeah, I mean, and I, and I think that's where the opportunity, similar to Danny's comment, is I think we should support what Bill's presented, but I think we should have a conversation and see if 
and look to other towns and see how other towns approach this. And hopefully it's on a, 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 a visibility that we can look at or we can talk to other towns and just, just ask the question and maybe Bill, you're, you already do this. Um, I, I'd much rather have, you know, I, I, I'd hate Chris to every year, you know, we have a, a feeling that we need to somehow have a discussion and, and the employees feel like we're holding them back in any way. And there's just a much clearer pathway without, you know, maybe some of the, and I'm, I'm not saying it's negativity, but it, you know, it is, it, you know, it, it is their, the wages that they take home and, and there are current expectations and it gets hard too, when you change the rules, similar to what Bill said, you know, you change, you change, you have the policy surrounding paid time off and the employees that have been there forever that feel like, well, I have, I've had this, why are you changing on me? I got hired under these circumstances or these, this rule book. And, and sometimes it's a lot easier when you have turnover, but we don't want that. So it's like, it's a, it's a difficult situation. And I think we can have these conversations outside of this tonight. Yeah, and, um, and I agree. But, and I, I, I would encourage that. And I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with Chris. He's, he's right. Pretty typically municipalities have something similar to this. And, you know, a lot of municipalities have unions. And if you look at the union contract, there's a step in grade that just happens automatically. And it's very, it's very frustrating, and we don't have that. We had a union here twice, one in the village police department and one in the highway department for, for a, a few years. And, uh, you know, the highway department, the, the union people that came in there just said, here's our standard contract, and this is how we want it to escalate, and this is what we're going to do. And, you know, I pushed back, and I said, no, we're not going to give – just that across the board thing every year, just because another year has gone by and you move up this way because another year has gone by and you move over that way if you, you know, if you move into a new position. And I basically ended up getting the union to agree to what I said a few minutes ago, which was, hey, if we have money, we're going to apportion it kind of to try to, you know, get people who are doing the same jobs on the same pay level and will reward seniority for something better. And after a while, the guys didn't like it and they decertified the union. So, you know, um, I, th I think that I'm, I'm trying hard, Chris. Yeah, one last thing and then let's move on. Um, your comment earlier about, you know, I choose to do what I choose and you do what you're you do what you choose to do the way i look at that bill is like it takes all the spokes in the wheel to make the wheel turn so we can't all be doctors we can't all be teachers we can't all be municipal staff you know no, no i i didn't mean it that way chris oh, i meant that no. you, i meant that you choose how you run your business i you know i understand the pressures and i i tried to explain to you that I've dealt with contractors and I said, geez, I don't think you're being fair to yourself. You, you're charging me the same thing this year as you charged me three years ago. That's not right. You know? So anyway, but I, I get yeah. the pressures. I understand. Okay. Um, Mike, go ahead. I'll be real brief. I think what both Mark and Danny said, we do have to have a long-term conversation everyone has to recognize that public employees and private employees are different. And sometimes private employees, if a business is really well, they may be flowing bonuses out, out, out the door. You know, public employees have more cost of living, you know, you know, not like the private sector. There are differences. People choose different careers based upon that. And, but I think long term, we just do have to have some sort of discussion on what compensation is, because you want to be fair to everyone. I hear what Chris is saying, you know, you know, the pub, the private sector looks at, well, they're not guaranteed raises every year like the public sector typically does. It's just something we have to figure out what's an equitable system, what's a fair way to go. go. I, I, I just want to have it where it's based upon merit more than anything else. 
Thanks. Okay. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Oh, unless somebody else wants to do it. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I move to accept the um, amendment in pay range submitted by Bill Slower for municipal employees. That's Bill, fine. does he need to speak more to the letter or just because you have control over the two percent conversation and it's not necessarily two percent for everybody, right? It, more or less it will be, but yeah, I think Danny's motion is is fine uh, okay. to approve the ranges and um, agree with the the sentiment with regard to um, you know the executing the budget as it has been adopted. That'll take care of it. Okay. Danny, are you okay with those changes? That's exactly what I said. Mm -hmm. okay. And just to clarify, Sorry. Bill. No. Just to clarify, we will be having a group discussion um, about merit-based raises later on, the possibility of those. We shouldn't put that in the motion. I know, but just for me to understand, okay. we will be having a... Um, not necessarily, Katie. The, 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 board, the board and the voters approved the budget and the, and the manager's job is to execute the budget. You can certainly have a discussion about me, um, but I don't, you know, I, I don't have to come back to the board to say that so-and-so is gonna get a raise. I mean, if we want it, we can have, I'm, I'm very uh, much in favor of what Danny suggested before that we, you know, I can show you what the budget looks like, where the increases are, where our payroll is now compared to where it was. And I think, you know, especially if you compare 2019, 20, and 21, it's pretty, it's pretty flat. But um, the, I don't think it, it should be the board's prerogative.